Chapter 61, I'm with him. Pick them up. These are your weapons. Matthew tried to give the zombies an order. This process was not easy. Never overestimate the intelligence and ability to use tools of ordinary undead creatures. It was much more difficult to instruct them to adapt to a complicated tool like a shovel than to learn how to operate an excavator. Fortunately, Matthew was very patient. Like a kindergarten worker, he taught the little zombies slowly. It took him nearly an hour to teach the zombies how to grip the shovel correctly. Phew! Matthew wiped his sweat. This process was very difficult, but the result was good enough. Zombies have meat, so it's different. He tried to dispatch one of the zombies to dig a hole in the open space. The latter tried a few times. Not long after, an irregular pit appeared in front of Matthew. Pass. Matthew smiled contentedly. This was the superiority of zombies over skeletons. Being closer to the structure of a human palm meant that they could easily grasp the tools that they could easily grasp when they were alive. But skeletons couldn't. Skeletons could be slashed with knives or smashed with small round shields. However, their hands could not hold weapons or tools steadily for a long time. It was quite possible that their bones would fall off as they worked. This was also an important reason why Matthew had never let the undead creatures participate in his work. But now, things were different. He could command the Silver Moon zombies to dig holes, which would greatly increase the efficiency of planting trees. In the future, I can focus more on site selection, transplantation, and maintenance. Matthew led the zombies all the way to the northwest. Very quickly. On the barren land under the moonlight. There was a group of figures who worked tirelessly. I never thought zombies could do this kind of work. Eli appeared silently. He looked at the zombies with a complicated expression. They don't look like evil creatures at all. They look more like a group of farmers. Matthew smiled and said. Undead creatures are not evil in the first place. It's just that for other life forms, their existence is too different, so it will cause people to panic and reject them subconsciously. Eli frowned. He obviously didn't agree with Matthew. However, he did not refute him. Instead, he took the initiative to change the topic. It seems peaceful these few days, but the evil hasn't gone far. I can sense their existence. Witherers. Matthew's expression became serious. Eli nodded vigorously. They're really cunning and patient. They've been watching from the shadows, which gives me a bad feeling. Perhaps we should try to change our strategy. Waiting for them to attack is too passive. Matthew muttered. If we want to draw the snake out of its hole, we need to make more preparations. Eli said confidently. As long as they dare to show themselves, they will definitely not be my match. As for preparations, haven't you done a lot these past few days? There were magic traps everywhere outside the small wooden house. I almost stepped on them. Matthew spread his hands. Those are just warning spells, and it's hard to say if they'll be of much use. The important thing is that once we choose to lure them, we must wipe them out. Eli loosened his muscles. I'm ready. Matthew had been thinking about this for the past few days. Since Eli's fighting spirit was surging, he was not afraid. He thought for a while and agreed. How about this? We'll hide in the moonlight woodlands tonight. I'll instruct the oak tree fairies to be on the watch. If the witherers make any strange movements, we'll come back immediately. Wait for me over there. I'll get Ella to open the door for you. Eli agreed. Not long after. Matthew summoned Ella to bring Eli to the moonlight woodlands first. And Matthew wanted to find Lulu and explain the matter. The witherers destroyed the trees very quickly. If they wanted to minimize the losses, the oak fairy's vigilance was crucial. Moonlight Woodlands The fourth level of the hive. Eli wandered around idly. The unique scenery and style here made him feel a little disappointed. He still remembered. The last time he was here, he was still fighting alongside Samantha. But now. When he thought of that cold, exquisite, confident, and independent face, he felt unbearable pain in his heart. Damn it. I shouldn't have come to this damn place. Eli kicked the rock in displeasure. Bang. The rock flew far away and smashed into the wall, creating a deep dent. The echo could not stop for a long time. Eli touched his forehead. The pain didn't ease, but it deepened. Every time he thought of Samantha. It was as if a large piece of his heart was suddenly missing. This feeling of emptiness was torturous. What is she doing now? 
will she also regret saying those words to me? If only I could see her again. All sorts of thoughts rose in Eli's mind. The longing in his heart grew stronger. A strong urge urged him to move forward. He didn't walk far. A leopard suddenly jumped out from the tunnel next door. Samantha. Eli looked at him in surprise and joy. The leopard quickly transformed into a human. However, what made Eli's heart ache was. Her first reaction when she saw him was to frown. Did you cause that commotion just now? Samantha glanced at the marks on the wall and asked coldly. Chapter 62, I'm with him. Eli was stunned. His mind was in a mess as if he did not know whether to admit or deny it. However, Samantha didn't want to be entangled with him for too long. She scolded coldly. Listen, Eli, it's over. Can you stop being childish? I don't have time to play games with you. I'm very busy. Now, please leave the Moonlight Woodlands immediately. The members of the Earth Society really shouldn't stay here for too long. Samantha's words sounded normal, but they were like sharp knives stabbing into Eli's heart. His face was extremely pale. His throat wriggled, but he could not say a word. Samantha continued. Please stop pestering me. This is the Moonlight Woodlands, the kingdom of the Moonlight Goddess. You are trespassing. Eli's pale face instantly swelled with a thick layer of blood. He had never felt so embarrassed before. Just as he was feeling extremely embarrassed, a gentle voice sounded behind him. Sorry for being late. Not far away. Matthew rushed over with Ella, and Samantha looked surprised. Then, she heard Matthew say. I'm sorry for the misunderstanding, but Eli is with me. Hearing this. Eli was like a drowning man who had grabbed onto a life-saving straw. His voice suddenly became louder. That's right. I'm with him. The embarrassment he felt just now disappeared in an instant, and Eli subconsciously puffed out his chest. Matthew walked over and patted Eli on the shoulder, then waved at Samantha. In that case, we'll take our leave first. The two of them walked away with their arms around each other's shoulders. Samantha looked at the scene in a daze. The dull expression on her face could not calm down for a long time. It was not until Eli's back completely disappeared from sight. She suddenly had the illusion that something that originally belonged to her had been snatched away. The night was exceptionally long. In order to deal with any unexpected situations, Matthew and Eli did not go deep into the hive. Instead, they swept through the areas that had been roughly wiped out on the fifth floor. However, the witherer's patience was better than they had imagined. Not only did they not gain anything by daybreak. It was the same for several nights. The witherer didn't move. The oak forest was calm. Matthew could only announce that his plan to lure the snake out of the cave had failed. Eli then proposed a plan to actively track them. He wanted to use his tracking ability to find the witherers and wipe them out in one fell swoop. Unfortunately, he was a shapeshifter who was more inclined to fight head-on rather than a wilderness master who was better at tracking. Every witherer was a true master of anti-tracking. Matthew was afraid of being lured away, so he did not dare to act rashly. Just like that. The witherers became a thorn in Matthew's heart. To pull it out, Matthew went to look for Zeller to ask him for divination. However, Zeller said that he had divined too many times recently. He needed to slow down to ensure the accuracy. Matthew could only helplessly put this matter on hold. Fortunately, he was very patient. Just treat it as a breath-holding competition with them. Let's see who can have the last laugh. Just like that. A few days of seemingly peaceful but actually turbulent days passed. Three nights later. Matthew's living room. Ding dong ding dong. Someone rang the bell. Before Matthew could get up to open the door, a gust of wind came out of the kitchen and headed straight for the front door. Is Sif here? I remember that today is the day you and she agreed to make up for the missed lessons. Peggy asked happily as she opened the door. Matthew nodded helplessly. Matthew, you'd better come over. Outside the door. Peggy's voice sounded a little grumpy. I don't remember you having so many students who need extra lessons. The living room can barely fit so many people, but there's definitely not enough milk. Matthew looked up in confusion. In the next second. A group of people filed in. Sif, who was walking at the front, was smiling. Following behind her was a tensed up Riagar. Then there was the bearded Blake, the handsome Zeller, and Richard who was holding a gentleman's cane. Finally. A surprised Samantha followed them in. She was holding a thick book bag in her hand. 
a group of people rushed in. The originally empty and spacious living room suddenly became lively and crowded. Chapter 62, I'm with him. Eli was stunned. His mind was in a mess as if he did not know whether to admit or deny it. However, Samantha didn't want to be entangled with him for too long. She scolded coldly. Listen, Eli, it's over. Can you stop being childish? I don't have time to play games with you. I'm very busy. Now, please leave the Moonlight Woodlands immediately. The members of the Earth Society really shouldn't stay here for too long. Samantha's words sounded normal, but they were like sharp knives stabbing into Eli's heart. His face was extremely pale. His throat wriggled, but he could not say a word. Samantha continued. Please stop pestering me. This is the Moonlight Woodlands, the kingdom of the Moonlight Goddess. You are trespassing. Eli's pale face instantly swelled with a thick layer of blood. He had never felt so embarrassed before. Just as he was feeling extremely embarrassed, a gentle voice sounded behind him. Sorry for being late. Not far away. Matthew rushed over with Ella, and Samantha looked surprised. Then, she heard Matthew say. I'm sorry for the misunderstanding, but Eli is with me. Hearing this. Eli was like a drowning man who had grabbed onto a life-saving straw. His voice suddenly became louder. That's right. I'm with him. The embarrassment he felt just now disappeared in an instant, and Eli subconsciously puffed out his chest. Matthew walked over and patted Eli on the shoulder, then waved at Samantha. In that case, we'll take our leave first. The two of them walked away with their arms around each other's shoulders. Samantha looked at the scene in a daze. The dull expression on her face could not calm down for a long time. It was not until Eli's back completely disappeared from sight. She suddenly had the illusion that something that originally belonged to her had been snatched away. The night was exceptionally long. In order to deal with any unexpected situations, Matthew and Eli did not go deep into the hive. Instead, they swept through the areas that had been roughly wiped out on the fifth floor. However, the witherer's patience was better than they had imagined. Not only did they not gain anything by daybreak. It was the same for several nights. The witherer didn't move. The oak forest was calm. Matthew could only announce that his plan to lure the snake out of the cave had failed. Eli then proposed a plan to actively track them. He wanted to use his tracking ability to find the witherers and wipe them out in one fell swoop. Unfortunately, he was a shapeshifter who was more inclined to fight head-on rather than a wilderness master who was better at tracking. Every witherer was a true master of anti-tracking. Matthew was afraid of being lured away, so he did not dare to act rashly. Just like that. The witherers became a thorn in Matthew's heart. To pull it out, Matthew went to look for Zeller to ask him for divination. However, Zeller said that he had divined too many times recently. He needed to slow down to ensure the accuracy. Matthew could only helplessly put this matter on hold. Fortunately, he was very patient. Just treat it as a breath-holding competition with them. Let's see who can have the last laugh. Just like that, a few days of seemingly peaceful but actually turbulent days passed. Three nights later. Matthew's living room. Ding dong ding dong. Someone rang the bell. Before Matthew could get up to open the door, a gust of wind came out of the kitchen and headed straight for the front door. Is Sif here? I remember that today is the day you and she agreed to make up for the missed lessons. Peggy asked happily as she opened the door. Matthew nodded helplessly. Matthew, you'd better come over. Outside the door. Peggy's voice sounded a little grumpy. I don't remember you having so many students who need extra lessons. The living room can barely fit so many people, but there's definitely not enough milk. Matthew looked up in confusion. In the next second. A group of people filed in. Sif, who was walking at the front, was smiling. Following behind her was a tensed-up Riagar. Then there was the bearded Blake, the handsome Zeller, and Richard, who was holding a gentleman's cane. Finally. A surprised Samantha followed them in. She was holding a thick book bag in her hand. A group of people rushed in. The originally empty and spacious living room suddenly became lively and crowded. Chapter 63, Calamity Mage As he had been living in a wooden house outside the city recently, and people would visit him from time to time, Matthew decided to set Mondays and Tuesdays as his rest days every week. He would return home to live in the next two days and deal with some matters related to him in the town. However, he did not expect this. The number of visitors on his first rest day had already exceeded five. 
Fortunately, the living room was big enough. After the initial reception, Matthew went over one by one and asked why they were here. Sif was there for a class. The value of a super version of the magic bag was obviously not something that could be offset by a hasty history class. In fact, Matthew was already mentally prepared to give her a private lesson for half a year. Riagar's reason for being there was more interesting. Matthew guessed that the father and daughter had been arguing at home already. In the end, Riagar promised Sif to come to Matthew's place every Monday for tuition, but the condition was that he had to follow along. Matthew did not have any objections to this. After all, when it came to lectures, it didn't matter how many students there were. As long as Riagar didn't get in his way, there wouldn't be a problem. Among the other visitors, Blake had come to ask Matthew if he needed help with the guarding of the Oak Forest. He knew that Matthew had been staying in the Oak Forest recently, and he happened to receive an order to increase patrols, so he came to ask Matthew if he needed the help of the garrison. Zeller and Richard's visit was obviously related to the ritual of plunder that Matthew recalled. As for Samantha, she brought the information about the So Country as promised. In the living room, Matthew's brain spun rapidly. He was preparing to arrange the reception according to the priority of the matter. At this moment, Sif stood up obediently. Matthew, since you have so many guests, I'll go to the kitchen with Peggy first. As she spoke, she decided to drag the confused Riagar to the kitchen. But at this moment, Zeller, who had been smiling, said. I took a look around outside. There's actually nothing particularly urgent for Matthew, right? I heard from Sif that she's here for your lessons. I've long been interested in Mr. Matthew's history class. If you don't mind, you can teach Sif first while we listen from the side. Isn't this a very novel experience? It was unknown if it was due to his high charm. Zeller's words received unanimous approval from the others. Yes, yes. I've long heard that Matthew's class is very popular, but I haven't had the chance to attend it. Blake scratched his beard, his face filled with interest. Richard elegantly put his cane aside. Sure, I have no objections. Rigger was originally there to accompany the lecture, so he naturally wouldn't say anything. Samantha was the only one left. Matthew looked at her questioningly. The latter smiled sweetly. My knowledge of history is almost zero. If you don't mind, I'd like to sit down and listen too. Thus, the slightly disturbed living room quickly quieted down. Everyone looked at Matthew curiously. Matthew wasn't afraid. He treated the living room as a school and the adults in front of him as children. He took out the thick history book that he had prepared for Sif. Just as he was about to open the book and begin his lecture. At this moment, a faint voice came from the kitchen. Matthew, remember to make it exciting. The first lesson can be free, but the lessons after this will not be free. Matthew smiled helplessly. He cleared his throat. Last time, I told Sif about the historical event of the 100 City Division. This event is actually familiar to everyone. It means that the influence of the Alliance of Seven Saints on the city-states across the continent has reached an unprecedented peak. Its effect was objective. After the division, every major city on the continent had at least one mage from the Seven Saint Alliance. These mages had made indelible contributions to the development and construction of their respective cities. Even after a hundred years, people would never forget the contributions of that batch of mages. Of course, the subsequent development of the Hundred Cities Division didn't follow the Seven Saint Alliance's plan. In the actual implementation of the plan, many flaws appeared, so much so that there were several disputes within the Alliance over whether to continue the strategy or not. From the perspective of hindsight, this plan was actually a failure. Hundreds of years after the gods had left, the largest human organization in Inder was still the Loose Seven Saint Alliance, which was essentially a mage organization. The human kingdom is just a name that the Seven Saint Alliance has created. In fact, we all know that no human force on this continent is qualified to be called a kingdom. We have towns, cities, manor owners, and lords, but we don't have a kingdom or a king. And all of this was thanks to the gods. At this point, Matthew paused for a moment and took a sip of water while observing everyone's reaction. There were six audiences present. Half of them were confused. They were Sif, Blake, and Samantha. The remaining three revealed thoughtful expressions. Isn't this what it should be like? Isn't this a good thing? Under Matthew's encouraging gaze, Samantha boldly asked. Chapter 64, Calamity Mage Whether it's humans, elves, or druids, 
we're all doing pretty well now. I mean, the structure of a city-state is also very good. People don't disturb each other, so why must we form a kingdom? Matthew did not answer immediately. He looked at Riagar. The latter's expression was also very serious. He actually took the initiative to say. In terms of social organization, a kingdom that can control more city-state resources at the same time will be a more advanced, risk-resistant and powerful existence than an independent city-state. I've traveled to other worlds, and many of their places are indeed more developed than ours. The simplest and crudest example is that if a kingdom composed of multiple city-states declared war on an independent city-state, the latter would almost certainly lose. Matthew nodded in agreement. We all know the principle of strength in numbers. As a social creature, an organization that could allow more humans to form groups would definitely trample over those fighting alone. In fact, the transition from a single city-state to a union of many city-states was inevitable in the development of history. This point could be verified by the development of other planes or worlds. We might not have much information in this area, but the Seven Saint Alliance has looked into it a lot. Sif was puzzled. Then why hasn't there been a kingdom on the continent yet? Weren't the gods exiled long ago? Matthew said in a deep voice, You might forget what I'm about to say after hearing it today, but it doesn't matter. Forgetting doesn't mean that the truth doesn't exist. We all know that 470 years ago, the founder of the Seven Saint Alliance, the great existence whose name is still unknown to the people. We usually respectfully address her as the first and only calamity mage in human history. She was angry at the gods' lack of progress and enslavement of all living beings, so she personally planned and executed the most wonderful mage performance in history, Ascension of the Heavenly Palace. Our world had been stuck in the Age of Enlightenment that the gods limited for a full 2,000 years. In the past 2,000 years, there had been no significant progress in human society. 2,000 years ago, human ancestors fished in the river and farmed on the ground. 2,000 years later, their descendants still used the same fishing tools and farming methods. At that time, the world was lifeless, and you could not feel the progress of the world from the changes of time. This was because, in the early days of the Age of Enlightenment, the gods who divided the theocracy and faith had woven rules and regulations for everything in the world. They used their clergy to divide their territories and bound everything with their concepts. They treated this world as their pasture. They only wanted to harvest the faith of all living beings day after day. They were not willing to see their believers make any meaningful progress. Time was meaningless to this world. It was just a counter for the gods to harvest faith. Under the high pressure of the gods. All living beings could not save themselves, they could not even develop the consciousness to save themselves. Until the arrival of the Calamity Mage. This situation was finally broken. That day. All the statues on the continent collapsed. Countless shrines or temples rose out of thin air, and the heavenly palace, which symbolized the glory of the gods in the past, also soared into the sky. They carried and bound the will of the gods and flew to the highest point of the astral world with a shrill cry. People knelt around the temple in fear. They did not know what had happened. To this day, we still don't know what happened that day. We only know that after that day, most of the existences that had been touched by the divine in this world were banished forever by the Calamity Mage. This, is the ascension of the heavenly palace. Matthew's tone was very calm. However, the history itself was enough to shock all audiences. Even Riagar and Zeller. They might have heard of the ascension of the heavenly palace. However, they only vaguely knew that that was when the gods left. They didn't know that the gods had been exiled. They couldn't imagine that the one who banished the gods was a mere human mage. Is, is this a myth? Riagar muttered, I thought it was the seven saints who joined forces to reach an agreement with the gods. And the gods left willingly. Matthew smiled and shook his head. The seven saints were very strong, but they were not strong enough to bargain with the gods. In history, they were all disciples of the Calamity Mage. After the gods left, our world finally began to change. Farmers invented farming tools and discovered crops with higher yields. Fishing boats floated on the seas and rivers. We had fishing nets, harpoons, and all kinds of new fishing gear. Tailors found better materials than cotton, linen, and animal skins. The craftsmen improved the craftsmanship and production process. City-states rose up one after another, and human exchanges became more frequent. According to normal development, we should have welcomed the first true human kingdom long ago. However, the gods who were far away were still unwilling to be left out. After the Calamity Mages left, 
they imposed three curses on the land in an attempt to delay the changes of the world and ensure that the divine concepts they defined continued to exist. Hearing this, everyone's expression was solemn. They were all shocked by this mysterious and bold narration, and at the same time, they were extremely curious about the curse of the gods that Matthew mentioned. He took a sip of water and continued. Chapter 65, Calamity Mage I only know two of the three curses. The last one was not even introduced in the book that Great Mage Ronan gave me. The two curses that I know of are Imon as the Intelligence Lock and the Civilization Lock. As he spoke, he first explained the contents of the locks. Then, he explained Civilization Lock. Similar to the Intelligence Lock, the curse of the gods has actually taken away a part of what made us humans. The intelligence lock takes away the memory ability of history and knowledge of all humans with intelligence below 15 points, while the civilization lock blocks the possibility of the evolution of human civilization. As he spoke, Matthew looked at Rigger. Mr. Rigger, you are the lord of Rolling Stone Town. You have a large territory, including 16 villages in the north and south and two trading posts. But have you ever thought of expanding the scale of Rolling Stone Town? Have you ever thought of annexing the surrounding cities? Don't you want more power? Rigger frowned and thought for a while, then shook his head hard. My rationality tells me that what you said is not a bad idea, but for some reason, I'm not interested in the concept of expanding my domain. Is this the function of the civilization lock? Matthew nodded. If you were the only one who despised expanding territory, then it might be a coincidence. However, almost all the city lords have no ambition to annex the territory around them. This is clearly the power of the curse. Samantha suddenly said. But isn't it a good thing that there's no war? At least there wouldn't be so many people who would be displaced and separated from each other. Matthew replied seriously. That is true from an individual point of view, but objective laws cannot be ignored. If our civilization remains stagnant, we may one day die suddenly, perhaps due to an accident or an invasion from an enemy. This is not an exaggeration, but these are words left behind by the Calamity Mage within the Alliance. I believe that she came from beyond the heavens, so she must have witnessed the rise and fall of some civilizations. The reason why she made the decision to exile the gods was probably not because of anger, but something else. Samantha was stunned. Although her thinking was old-fashioned, she was quite smart. She instantly understood Matthew's meaning. Are you saying that our world might be invaded by foreign enemies in the future? In the face of such an enemy, we could only survive by having all the races form a kingdom. Matthew blinked. It is indeed possible. The Seven Saint Alliance has made many guesses about this, but they are all just guesses at the moment. After all, the existence of Purgatory and Abyss has been proven. If demons or devils invade our world one day, it will be difficult for us to survive on our own strength without the protection of the gods. All in all, the era of the gods was long gone. Even if there were curses left behind, their power would become weaker and weaker. According to Master Ronan's prediction, our world is on the eve of rapid changes. In the next second, this world might undergo earth-shattering changes. I think we're lucky to be born in this era. At the very least, compared to our ancestors, we will have the opportunity to use our own strength to change the world, or even to redefine some new concepts. Samantha looked at Matthew thoughtfully. Like nature. Matthew smiled and closed his book. That will be the content of the next class. Peggy, who appeared out of nowhere, interrupted. That's right, that's right. After the lesson. In the living room, there is only silence. Everyone was silently digesting the cognitive shock brought by Matthew. Matthew himself was also using this to strengthen his memory. His intelligence was high enough to be immune to the intelligence lock, but there was a certain chance that he would forget. Teaching was a good way to strengthen his memory, which was the main reason why he did not reject giving everyone a lesson that night. Ten minutes later. Matthew took a bag of documents from Samantha and sent her away. At the door. Samantha suddenly turned around and looked into Matthew's eyes. Is Eli with you now? Matthew explained frankly. He was grateful for my unintentional enlightenment in his domain, so he temporarily worked as a forest ranger at my forest. Samantha nodded thoughtfully. Is the forest the origin of your oak domain? Matthew nodded. Your domain enlightenment is very special and left a deep impression on me. That oak forest is the same. Perhaps I should find time to go there and take a look. Samantha bit her lip. Her eyes drifted as she said this. Then, 
she transformed into a leopard and jumped away. The second to leave was Blake. Matthew was very grateful that Big Beard always remembered him. The two of them discussed for a while. In the end, he rejected Blake's suggestion to increase the number of patrols near the Oak Forest. This might alert the enemy. Blake's alternative was to set up a hidden sentry not far from the Oak Forest. Most of the time, there would be guards on duty. This way, once a battle broke out in the Oak Forest, Blake would be the first to receive the news and rush over to provide support. Matthew did not feel invincible just because he had the Bone Dragon. It was safer to have the support of the garrison. Blake agreed to this request. He patted his chest and assured Matthew that the secret sentry would be set up tomorrow night at the latest. This made Matthew feel much more at ease. Finally, it was Zeller and Richard. Matthew, according to what you said about the initiation ritual, we have picked out three iconic buildings the giant windmill in the North Trade Station, the Black Vulture Inn in the South Trade Station, and the Seven Saints Square in Rolling Stone Town. If a bloody tragedy happens in these three places, it will definitely shock the entire Rolling Stone Town the next day. At present, we have secretly strengthened the reconnaissance and patrols in these three places. Zeller asked quickly, in addition, our operation must begin. Are you ready? Matthew knew that Zeller's plan was for him to disguise himself as Ronan and create a cloud of suspicion to slow down the evil organization's pace of crime. I don't have a problem with it, but you have to tell me your plan first. Matthew replied. The late spring festival is coming soon. We all know that every year during the late spring festival, the great mage Ronan will release huge magic fireworks in the Seven Saints Square, the North-South Trade Post, and some small villages to celebrate the prosperity of spring with the residents. Zeller calmly explained, but in fact, Ronan is very busy. There were several years when he was not in Rolling Stone Town during the Spring Festival. Those fireworks were set off by his apprentice. In order not to affect the festive atmosphere, he had already made arrangements for this. At present, there were still some devices in the warehouse of the City Hall that could release magic fireworks, so releasing fireworks itself was not a problem. This year, we couldn't contact Ronan, and we didn't hear from his apprentice. If we want to make it look like he's still with us, the key is his image. It's difficult to fool the enemy with just makeup. We need the help of magic. Matthew shook his head. I don't know anything about transfiguration. Zeller smiled gently. What a coincidence. Me too. However, I have another way. Since our goal is to create a false sense of confusion, there's no need to make everything seem real. We just need to keep them suspicious. I don't think they'll come up close to check whether you're the real Ronan or not. I'll try my best to dress you up as Ronan and then use the mirror image spell to send your image to all parts of Rolling Stone Town. At that time, someone else will set off the fireworks. What you need to do is to make yourself look like a great mage. After all, you are the only mage we can find in our town. Matthew put his hands together and thought for a while before finally agreeing to Zeller's plan. There was no risk in this plan. If it could really deter the evil organization, it would be considered a merit. Immediately. The two of them discussed many details. All the way until late at night. Zeller reluctantly left Matthew's house with Richard, who was yawning crazily. Meanwhile, Sif had been brought home by Riagar. After all the guests had left. The lively atmosphere instantly disappeared. Matthew sat alone in the living room, enjoying the sweet silence. He sat. His chest suddenly felt as if it had been pried open by something powerful. The scenery in front of him began to blur. Matthew's heart skipped a beat. Suddenly. He saw that the grey comma of the Tai Chi symbol had been filled up without him realizing it. At this moment. Countless grey dots were jumping out of it. Hint, you are visiting the subdomain of death, undying. Chapter 66, Cross Dressing and Succubus Looking up, he saw an endless plane. Countless craters were scattered across the ground. The sky is grayish-brown. The same was true of the horizon. A huge full moon hung between heaven and earth. It was like the undying soul fire. The silence was the eternal theme here. Even the wind was silent. Endless whirlwinds came from an unknown place and blew to the next unknown place. The undead creatures that were swept up by the whirlwind either choked and fell or regained their vitality. Death and metamorphosis played out different stories in the same negative energy whirlwind. Matthew walked alone on this quiet land. It was different from the lively and noisy experience in the oak tree domain. Everything here was so quiet. It was very similar to the concept of this place. Death. 
a skeleton walked towards him. Almost none of its bones were intact, and its soul fire was pitifully weak. It seemed that as long as a gust of wind blew, this newborn skeleton soldier would lose its last chance to live again. However, it was very tenacious. Matthew saw with his own eyes that it was blown into a bottomless pit by the negative energy whirlwind. According to his guess, this skeleton would definitely fall apart. And that indeed happened. Matthew noticed that it stayed in the hole for a long time. It was so long that Matthew began to doubt whether time had meaning in this domain. At a certain moment, he saw the skeleton climb out of the hole again. The earlier tornado had destroyed its last remaining thigh bone. It managed to recover a little before it struggled to get up from the ground. Matthew noticed. The soul fire in its eyes burned even brighter. It turns out that undead creatures also have such a strong will to live. Matthew was slightly moved. This skeleton clearly did not have much intelligence. It did not even know where it should go. However, from the moment it ignited its soul fire, it possessed the instinct to survive. Perhaps in the next moment, it would be completely extinguished by another whirlwind. But before that, it would continue to move forward. To that unknown place, a place where the fire of life could bloom. After stopping for a moment, Matthew continued forward. Along the way, he brushed past all kinds of undead creatures. Zombies, ghosts, banshees, vampires, ghouls, headless horsemen, death horsemen, dark knight, abomination, tomb guard, mummy. Some of them were strong, and some were weak. However, they were all heading towards the unknown. Here, none of the undead creatures knew what was ahead. Very few people could explain the purpose of constant moving. But moving forward was the only purpose. Death is eternal silence, and the undead are existences that persist in advancing in eternal silence. They may not be actual living creatures, but they are just like living creatures, fighting against death tirelessly. They were destined to be unable to escape the barrier of death, but they could no longer be simply regarded as the vassals of death. This is the undead dot. Matthew came to the end of the horizon with this conclusion. He stood in front of the eternal full moon. A wind blew from above. So the negative energy wind is blowing down from the moon. He curiously looked at the celestial body that was close at hand but far away on the horizon. In the next second, the scene in front of him shattered like a mirror. The view shook slightly. Matthew's consciousness returned to his living room. Based on the accumulation of summoning undead creatures and the exploration of negative energy planes, you have successfully entered the subdomain of death, undying. As a reward for stepping into the domain, you can choose one of the following three abilities. Undead body, your body can instantly transform into the shell of an undead creature. During this period, you will obtain the immunity and other characteristics of the undead creature, in the state of undead body, you will have the opportunity to gain more understanding of the undying domain. Lasts for 60 seconds once a day. Negative energy control, you will gain the opportunity to control negative energy. After choosing this ability, you will have the opportunity to obtain some negative energy spells. New summon, you will receive a random summoned undead that is not lower than tier 3. It was a difficult choice. Matthew frowned slightly. Unlike the Oak Domain and the Temperance Domain, he really wanted the three abilities given by the Undying Domain. As for the undead body, it was a life-saving skill and had the chance to increase the exploration progress of the Undying Domain. Negative energy control was the ability that necromancers dreamed of. With this ability, casting negative energy-related spells would be twice as effective. After all, the two main skills of necromancers were, summoning undead creatures and negative energy spells. As for the third option, new summon, it was less tempting. Matthew actually did not lack undead followers, but it would be perfect if he could summon a headless horseman or a dark knight. This would make up for his lack of strong followers in the melee. Although Peggy was also very fierce, Matthew was not willing to risk her life. Or death. He hesitated. Matthew gritted his teeth and chose the undead body. This was also out of consideration for the unity of knowledge and action. He didn't want to miss any life-saving skill, not to mention that this ability could increase the progress of the exploration of the undying domain. Perhaps it could lead to a virtuous cycle of progression. Chapter 67, Crow Stressing and Succubus You have completed the enlightenment of the undying domain. Current status, just entered the domain. You have obtained a permanent status, Undead Army. Undead Army, your maximum number of active summoned creatures has been increased by 10 times. You have obtained a temporary status, Pale Hand. 
pale hand, if not controlled, your right hand will continue to emit negative energy. When it comes into contact with any living thing, it will be instantly killed. Duration, 30 days. These two buffs are not bad. Matthew was quite satisfied. The undead army meant that the maximum number of his summoned creatures had increased to 120. This was a huge gap between him and an ordinary necromancer. The pale hand was equally powerful. It could inject negative energy into the undead creatures, making them energetic. At the same time, it could also give the enemy a fatal blow in an intense battle. Although the probability of instant death was very low. But what if he succeeded? What Matthew had to lose was a chance. But the enemy could lose his life at any time. This was the power of a domain. Matthew noticed. At this moment, the Taiji symbol became balanced again. The green dot on the right was slightly fuller, but not by much. What was even more interesting was. There was a small brown comma right below the Tai Chi symbol. Its size was only one-tenth of the size of the top commas. There were also light spots in the small commas, but the number was very small. Matthew knew that it represented the temperance domain. Now, he had already dabbled in three fields, oak, temperance, and the undying. Although he was only in the initial stage, as time passed, he would obtain a higher level of mastery of the domain. The most common legendary requirement is to master one domain. A legend who dabbles in three domains at the same time is already an elite. I'm only a tier 2 necromancer, but I've already dabbled in three domains in advance. The greatest convenience that the system provided him was the stepping stone to the domains represented by death and nature. Under a situation where the experience was abundant, he only needed to plant trees slowly, accumulate levels and spells, and in the future, he would soar to the sky. Two days have passed since the beginning of the year. Unknowingly, it was already the end of March. Rolling Stone Town welcomed the second festival of spring, late spring festival. With the help of the Silver Moon Zombies, Matthew's planting efficiency greatly increased. Before the spring festival, he had finally strengthened Soldier to level 14. He was only one level away from Matthew's highest level summoned creature, fully. Other than the rapid advancement in level, Soldier also gained a series of new abilities such as Clone Technique, Ruthless Multi Slash, Concealment Technique, Ground Shrinking, and Picking Onions on Dry Land. The quality of these keywords was only blue and white, but it also greatly enriched Soldier's combat methods. This Blade Dancer was like a nightmare for low and middle level adventurers. Of course. Matthew also encountered two questionable keywords. Alcoholic, Gray your skeleton is addicted to alcohol. Every 72 hours, he needs to drink at least one bottle of ale to relieve his restlessness. Cross dressing, Gray your skeleton has awakened the power of drag. He desires to wear some bright clothes or skirts. If you can dress him up beautifully, he will feel very happy. To be honest, Matthew was stunned when he first saw these two keywords. A skeleton that was addicted to alcohol? How could he drink it? Once the drink entered his mouth, wouldn't it leak out? As for the other keyword, it was easier to satisfy. Soldier's Dark Knight cloak was getting more powerful. Matthew could easily find Soldier some beautiful dresses to wear underneath it. What made Matthew most dissatisfied was that whether it was to do drag or to drink, he had to spend money. In order to save costs. Matthew bought some of the cheapest ale, and Soldier drank it without hesitation. Just as Matthew expected, the ale immediately spilled down Soldier's throat. However, Matthew also noticed. A portion of the alcohol seemed to have been absorbed by Soldier's soul fire. This was actually very interesting. It seriously violated the law of the undead. Anyone who could break the rules was definitely not an ordinary person. In this aspect, Soldier was already on PAR with Peggy. This was one of the few things that made Matthew feel gratified. As for her female clothing. Matthew went to the second-hand shop in town to buy two dresses. They were both tattered old ladies' clothes, but Soldier wore them with ease. It was just that Matthew wished he could unsee certain things. But aside from these small flaws, Soldier's strength had increased steadily. Late Spring Festival Matthew brought only one of his underlings to the Lord's Mansion. At this moment, the sky is dimly lit. The Spring Festival celebration had already begun. On the way, Matthew could hear the joyful sound of gongs and drums from the Spring Festival team outside the village. Late Spring Festival was the third and last day of the last week of March. Spring in Rolling Stone Town came and went very quickly. Two months ago, it was a snowy winter, and after March, it was a scorching summer. 
therefore, there was a grand festival in March. There were the early spring festival at the beginning of the month and the late spring festival at the end of the month. These two festivals were often celebrated grandly. They were also the two most significant festivals for the residents of Rolling Stone Town in the first half of the year. If they missed the late spring festival, the next festival of the same scale would be the Harvest Festival in Autumn. Chapter 68, Cross Dressing and Succubus Today, regardless of whether it was the residents of the town or the farmers in the countryside, they all woke up very early. This was because most people were very keen to participate in the various activities of the late spring festival. Unlike the early spring festival, which focused on celebrations, performances, and gatherings, the late spring festival attracted more attention from the different competitions and activities organized by the residents. This tradition originated from the Age of Enlightenment. It was said that the gods at that time held various sports competitions in the spring to select warriors from the human race. Later, it gradually evolved into a semi-official entertainment activity. Anyone could apply for a contest with the officials of Rolling Stone Town. Once the application was approved, they would receive a subsidy from the city hall. The participants of the contest were all registered on the spot, and the main purpose was to be entertaining and lively. When Matthew passed by the entrance of the mage area in the morning, he found that the people in charge of the grass-eating competition and ring competition were already moving materials to the spot. Near Seven Saints Square, the most popular Martin Run event was also drawing the finish line. There was also the one-handed and one-legged wrestling competition and the face-to-face -face wrestling fight that were also in the process of preparation. The entire Rolling Stone town was thriving. This scene made Matthew feel a little enlightened. In the past years, due to his obsession with planting trees, he did not even have the chance to watch the late spring festival, let alone participate in it. Today, the rich festive atmosphere aroused the idea in Matthew of participating in a few activities. Unfortunately, he had another mission. Today, I am the great mage Ronan. With this thought in mind, under the guidance of the guards, Matthew and Soldier arrived at the side hall of the Lord's residence. Although it was early, the manor was already bustling with noise. The servants were busy decorating for the festival, and the masters did not sleep in. Matthew heard Sift's voice as he walked through a porch. Oh, Daddy, I'm not a 15-year-old girl anymore. I don't want to dress like a little princess from a fairy tale today. Sif complained. But even after the day after tomorrow, you will still be a 16-year-old girl. Riagar's voice was very gentle. And isn't it good to dress like a little princess? They are very happy in the fairy tale. Sif snorted in dissatisfaction. I don't like it. Those clothes are too childish. Even if it's a fairy tale, I want to wear them like the female knights in the fairy tales. Riagar was silent for a few seconds before he reluctantly said, When you grow up, you'll have plenty of time to wear mature clothes. But today, promise me that you'll wear clothes that should be worn at your age, okay? These clothes are very beautiful. You might not wear them for a long time in the future. Just treat it as spending a few more years with them. There was a hint of reluctance in Riagar's voice. Sif was stunned for a moment, then happily agreed, All right, all right, I'll listen to you. I'll pick a princess dress. I love you, Dad. Riagar's pampering voice drifted over. I love you more, my little princess. Go. To the next room and let Shia help you put it on. What a sharp child. Matthew could even imagine the change in expression on Sif's face when she heard what Riagar had said. Although this girl had a strong personality, her nature was sharp and gentle. At least she did not let down Riagar's love for her. Matthew did not stay in the corridor for long. They passed through three corridors in a row. He finally arrived at the destination of this trip, a domed building on the west side of the Lord's residence. This was the residence of Zeller, Riagar's only magic consultant. You came on time. I was just about to get ready. Zeller, who was dressed fashionably and had a handsome face, came out to welcome him. His gaze lingered for a few seconds near Soldier, who was wearing the Dark Knight cloak. Then he led Matthew into the house. I've finished setting up the mirror image technique. I tested it twice yesterday, and the results were perfect. Zeller asked. By the way, have you eaten? I've eaten. Fried spring rolls and a cup of yogurt. Matthew replied. Peggy is such an enviable partner. Zeller looked enlightened. I heard Sif mention that her culinary skills are superb. Matthew smiled and nodded. Then I'll take you to get your makeup done. Zeller brought Matthew to the innermost room. 
there were many mirrors and a large number of bottles and jars of medicinal powders. Most of the materials were things that Matthew's knowledge was blind to. Although charm is bestowed by the heavens, as a man, you have to know how to take care of yourself and cherish it, Zeller explained with a smile. Then, like a hairdresser, he made Matthew sit down in front of a mirror. Then, he snapped his fingers. In the mirror in front of Matthew. Suddenly, a blonde, blue-eyed woman with an explosive figure appeared. Good morning, Zeller. The girl lazily rubbed her sleepy eyes as she walked out of the mirror. An incredible fragrance assaulted him. A force called desire began to tease Matthew's nerves. Lesna, don't use your charm on my guest. He won't fall for it. Zeller ordered sternly. The girl stuck out her tongue. In the next second. She sat on the stage in front of the mirror with her legs crossed. Her short skirt was silently pulled up, revealing a large area of snow-white skin. A slender tail with a heart at the tip extended from the bottom and swayed unconsciously. This scene was enough to make most men's mouths go dry. However, Matthew looked at Zeller calmly. Is this the makeup artist you found for me? Zeller heaved a sigh of relief. This is Lesna, my contracted partner. In most cases, she is also my family. Hint, your ability Heart of Tranquil Water is in effect. You have successfully resisted the charm of Succubus Lesna. Your Will Plus One Chapter 69, Martin Run Warlocks were indeed the legendary rich, and handsome profession. Even their contracted creatures were blonde succubi, unlike a bitter necromancer like him, who could only accompany skeletons and zombies all day long. This thought flashed across Matthew's mind. It would be a lie to say that he wasn't envious. Matthew joked with Zeller, with such a charming contract partner, no wonder you haven't married yet. Zeller waved his hand. You're mistaken. My relationship with Lesna is very pure. Matthew didn't believe it. Can you control yourself? Before Zeller could say anything, Lesna complained to Matthew. To tell you the truth, I often wonder if Zeller likes men. He always treats me as if I'm nothing. Most of the time, my charm seems to be released to the air. Zeller smiled gently. Of course not. There's no doubt about Lesna's charm, but I have my own way of doing things. Frankly speaking, it was not easy to resist her charm. Sometimes, I would be impulsive and waver, but I saw it as a form of training and challenge. Fortunately, I could always maintain control. Lesna rolled her eyes. Matthew had a little eye-opener. He had heard that most warlocks had a very licentious private life. They would do it with any creature that moved. However, Zeller was clearly an exception among warlocks. He had a succubus pet, but he could sit still and cultivate his willpower. This made Matthew suspect this guy's sexual orientation. The three of them chatted for a while. The atmosphere in the room gradually became lively. Lesna began to put makeup on Matthew. According to Zeller, this succubus lady was an expert in the field of makeup and disguise. Most of the time, the makeup done by Lesna's hands had an effect that surpassed illusions. Matthew did not have much understanding of this for the time being. He could only feel Lesna's small hands holding a powder pad and a paintbrush as she smeared it all over his face. It was itchy. Her body was very close to him. It was the instinct of a succubus. Matthew could feel the strong hormones that she inadvertently emitted at all times. If it weren't for the heart like still water, he would have made a fool of himself by now. Lesna was very focused on her work, but her expression didn't look very happy. About an hour later. The boring makeup session finally came to an end. Lesna threw away the pink cushion in her hand in frustration and said in an unfriendly tone, All right. Being in the same room with you two men is like going to jail. I thought you were scary enough, Zeller, but I didn't expect your friend to be the same as you. We've been glued together for so long, but he didn't react at all. Tell me. You must be gay too, right? Her tone was very aggressive. However, her expression was full of frustration, and her eyes were filled with self-doubt. I'm a normal man, but I'm better at temperance. Matthew explained calmly, not bothering to argue with a succubus. Then, he looked into the mirror, and his eyes lit up. The man in the mirror was exactly the same as the great mage Ronan in his memories. Very exquisite craftsmanship. Matthew couldn't help but praise. This sentence made Lesna feel much better. She gently bit her lower lip and reminded him, you'd better stuff a few more insoles into your shoes. I remember that Ronan is a few centimeters taller than you, and his body is also a little stronger than yours. 
but it doesn't matter. Anyway, you'll have a cloak to help cover it up later. As they spoke, Zeller had already walked over from the next room with a replica of the Archmage's robe and a magic cloak that Ronan used to wear on the late spring festival. Why don't you try on the clothes first? I'll get someone to look for the insoles later. Zeller looked at Matthew's face seriously and then showed a satisfied expression. Matthew took out a height-increasing scroll from his magical bag. If it's height, maybe this thing will come in handy. Zeller looked past the height-increasing scroll and focused on Matthew's bag for a few seconds. Is it the super version? Matthew was stunned for a moment before he nodded. You sure know how to spend. I've wanted to get a super magic bag for a long time, Zeller said. But I was too short of money to get one. Lesna snorted coldly and interrupted, if you stop donating to the orphanage, you could have bought yourself more than a few bags already. Or perhaps, if you had established your own family earlier, you would have earned much more than you do now. Zeller shrugged. Lesna, don't even think about it. I'm not leaving Rolling Stone Town. Never. I promised rigor. Lesna was so angry that her chest heaved up and down. That man again? I shouldn't have followed you because I thought highly of your potential. For the sake of Riagar, you even rejected the position of the Lord of Dragon Nest City. I think the man's wife was not as loyal to him as you were to him. Enough. Zeller's tone suddenly became stern. In front of the guests, please pay attention to your words. Lesna was obviously hot-tempered, or rather, she had a strong sense of resentment from the beginning to the end. Did you just yell at me? How many times have you scolded me for Riagar? You. A loud slap sounded. Chapter 70, Martin Run. Lesna was slapped to the ground by Zeller. You seem to be pushing your luck, succubus. Zeller bent down and pinched her chin hard. His tone was unprecedentedly cold. If you're really dissatisfied with the current situation, I can send you back to the Abyss at any time, no matter which Demon Lord's territory it is. But if you still want to stay by my side, you should learn to behave yourself. Promise me that this will be the last time. Lesna's eyes were filled with fear. She stammered, I promise, this is the last time. The last time what? Zeller asked coldly. This is the last time I tried to take advantage of you. I was wrong, Zeller. I didn't manage to arouse your friend's lust, so I was a little muddle-headed. Lesna replied with a trembling voice, Don't send me back to the abyss. I beg you. They'll break me. Very good. Now, apologize to Matthew. Zeller let go. Lesna stumbled and fell to the ground, two bruises on her smooth chin. I'm sorry, Mr. Matthew. I shouldn't have spoken nonsense in front of you. She apologized nervously. Matthew waved his hand, indicating that it was fine. Lesna was instantly relieved. With Zeller's permission. She carefully entered the mirror in front of Matthew and disappeared completely. I've embarrassed myself in front of you, Matthew. Zeller returned to his gentle and amiable appearance. Demons are different from ordinary creatures. If I treat them kindly, they will be more likely to be ungrateful and comolescent. Lesna is an example. If I don't punish her occasionally, she might think that she is my master. As he spoke, he smiled helplessly. Your summoned creature, Peggy, I see that you treat her very well too. Will she show such signs too? Matthew could understand Zeller's helplessness. Demons were indeed a unique species and could only be controlled by using both and cruelty. Thinking of this, he didn't envy Zeller for having a succubus anymore. At least his kindness with his summons was rewarded. No, no. Matthew smiled. Peggy has a lot of shortcomings, but overall, her personality is quite cute. The only thing that annoys me is that she often asks for a raise in salary, but I don't think that's her fault. A hint of envy appeared in Zeller's eyes. Then, shall we get up and change? The celebration is about to begin, and we're going to set off fireworks at the climax of the celebration. Matthew nodded. Then, he hesitated. What's wrong? Zeller asked. Although it's a little presumptuous, and the timing isn't right, can I ask Lady Lesna to charge my magic staff? Matthew took out his cough magic staff in embarrassment. He had followed the method of Tower Spirit 177 and charged the staff by holding the staff and imagining coughing. The result was shockingly inefficient about three seconds of imagination counted as one official charge, but at least 10,000 official charges were needed to charge the staff fully. Matthew had originally planned to charge it slowly, 
but since he had run into a succubus, he might as well take advantage of it. After all, Matthew didn't ask Zeller or the officials of Rolling Stone Town for compensation for helping him this time, right? Zeller took the staff and studied it for a while before nodding. Shinnick Energy? It shouldn't be a problem. I'll give it to Lesna later. The two of them stood up. After changing his clothes and getting taller, Zeller led Matthew to the hall where the mirror image ritual was set up. At noon, the Seven Saints Square in the center of Rolling Stone Town was packed with people. This was where many awards were given out. Although it had only started today, there were already many small contests that had already concluded. The contestants and their families and neighbors came to receive the award happily. A cheerful atmosphere pervaded the air. Under the statues of the Seven Saints, two men dressed as traveling merchants were whispering to each other. In front of them was a large wooden box with a large string of cotton candy inside. Today is the best day to break out of the prison. Look, a large number of guards have been transferred to the square to maintain order. I dare to bet that there is no one in the prison at all. A man in his twenties said in a low voice. You're right, Jonas, but Dean doesn't want to come out. That is our main problem. The man who answered him looked to be in his thirties. He was thin, and his eyes were bright, but he always looked lazy. Leon, why do you think Boss Dean is not willing to leave the prison? Jonas was puzzled. Who emos? Perhaps the food in the prison was better. Leon grabbed a marshmallow for himself and said casually while eating. I keep feeling like we're two big idiots. We came to Rolling Stone Town and didn't even know the specific mission. Jonas said unhappily, they only told us to disguise ourselves and sneak into the prison. In the end, Boss Dean ignored us. Are we really here to sell cotton candy? Leon comforted, we're not the only two who are here. There are other members of the Brotherhood and two other organizations. Don't worry. They must be doing something big. We just need to follow the orders and observe the situation in Rolling Stone Town. Jonas's eyes glided as he looked at the people around him, who were filled with laughter. But I feel that we've been discovered. How could they laugh so happily? Did they recognize us? Chapter 71, Martin Run Leon said helplessly. You're really too nervous, Jonas. Why don't you sit by the side? Jonas shook his head and said. No need. That will make me even more uncomfortable. Damn it, why would this countryside town make me so nervous? You have to know that I didn't even feel anything when I set fire to the White Bull Port's dock. Leon licked his marshmallow. Do you want one candy too? Or, you can just participate in a competition and have some fun. That's a good idea. Jonas's eyes lit up. I just saw that the prize for one of the events is a big jar of honey. My mother likes to eat honey. Why don't I give it a try? Leon put down the cotton candy in his hand. Wait, are you serious? Why? Participating in the activities of the country bumpkins was also a form of scouting, right? Jonas pushed away the box in front of him righteously and then walked towards a corner of the square impatiently. Leon could only push the cart to keep up. Hey guys, it's time for the annual Martin run. Wipe the solace of your shoes. Open your eyes. Remember to keep your balance and don't fall. Every year, people run into the manure pit or the drain, and that's not why we're holding the Martin run. Remember, the route is very important. I'll repeat the route one last time, start from the starting point, circle around the Seven Saints Square, and run to the east wall. When you reach the tower, remember to pick up the beacon. Then, turn back and pass through the craftsman area. After getting two beacons along the way, sprint towards the Seven Saints statue with all your strength. We will meet you there at the finish line. Now, everyone gets ready. Accompanied by the host's hoarse shouts, the surrounding crowd erupted into cheers and cheers. The Martin Run was the most popular event every year. Even other cities sent competitors over. Jonas was mixed in with the crowd, but he was not as nervous as before. He looked behind him. Behind the dense crowd of contestants, three people in huge fluffy uniforms were baring their fangs and brandishing their claws. They would play the role of the monsters chasing Martin in the event. Dot. The contestants were playing the role of the hero of the mythical story in Rolling Stone Town, the omnipotent and fastest Super Martin. Jonas had just listened to the host recount the story of Super Martin. He had to admit. That story was quite interesting. Hey, foreigner. A provocative voice came from beside him. Jonas frowned and looked over. 
the one who spoke was a fierce-looking big guy. Remember to scram further away when I speed up later. Otherwise, don't cry when you get knocked into the shit pit. Jonas was instantly annoyed. When he killed and set fire in White Bull Harbor, these country bumpkins were still playing house. He actually dared to take the initiative to threaten him. He wanted to teach this big guy a lesson. But at this moment, the host in front suddenly shouted. Martins! Run! The crowd exploded. The three monsters let out strange cries. More than forty people rushed forward. For a moment. The scene was extremely chaotic. Jonas was initially wrapped in the crowd. But very quickly. He found an opportunity to break out of the crowd. Arsonists were originally good at running, not to mention that Jonas was an outstanding arsonist. With a few swift moves, he had gotten to the middle of the group. Stop that foreigner. He just pushed me. The big guy's angry roar came from behind. Jonas sneered. He didn't expect these locals to be so uncultured. Do they even want to form cliques for a running competition? As expected. Suddenly, two men squeezed towards him. Jonas was angered. With a shout, his speed increased drastically. Whoosh! He passed those people like a phantom. Wow! The audience exclaimed from both sides of the road. Jonas was extremely pleased. Let these country bumpkins see what true speed is. He quickened his pace. He moved forward at an incredible speed. In the blink of an eye. He had already surpassed the first group, who had the advantage of starting the run first. So powerful. Good luck. He runs really fast. Amidst the enthusiastic cheers of the crowd. Jonas was completely immersed in the world of running. He tried to adjust his breathing and control his pace. The arsonist's strength was actually sprinting, but he did not want to lose to others, so he maintained a good speed even after taking the lead. The scene in front of him gradually became blurry. Only the cheers from both sides continued. Unknowingly. Jonas' hand was already filled with three beacons. In front of him. The finish line was just drawn under the statues of the seven saints. At that moment. A tsunami of cheers came. Almost everyone was cheering for Jonas' wonderful performance. He was also greatly encouraged. He sprinted all the way to the finish line. Let us welcome the champion of this Martin run, Mr. Jonas. He is joining the race for the first time. The host roared. Everyone applauded. A few young men ran over enthusiastically. Someone helped Jonas put on the wreath that symbolized a champion. The others joined forces to lift him up and throw him into the air. He fell down, and then they threw him into the air again. Jonas. Jonas. Impressive Jonas. Everyone was celebrating enthusiastically. Jonas himself was completely smug. He enjoyed the crowd. In a daze. He was escorted to the makeshift podium by everyone. Hey, the amazing Jonas. The host said loudly. You are the well-deserved champion, and you even beat the previous record by a full minute. May I ask how you did it? Jonas was about to answer. The host suddenly stuffed a large jar of honey into his hand. This is the reward for the champion. Immediately after. A few fully armed garrison members appeared behind him. Ah! Before Jonas could react. He was already subdued by the powerful team members. Sorry, but you ran too fast. We have reason to suspect that you are a member of the Silver Frost Brotherhood. The bearded leader explained apologetically, come with us. If it's proved to be our mistake later. I'll personally compensate you with a jar of honey. At that moment, Jonas felt his ears buzzing. He frantically searched for traces of Leon in the crowd. But he couldn't find Leon. All he saw were shocked faces. The people did not seem to have realized why the garrison team wanted to arrest this young man who was running so fast. At this moment, everyone was surprised to find that the sky had turned dark. Bang! At the same time, the clear sound of fireworks exploded in the man-made night. Colorful patterns spread out at any time. The crowd cheered and clapped for the sudden magic fireworks. Ronan! Ronan! Someone was cheering the name of the mage. When he heard this word, Jonas' muddled mind suddenly became extremely clear-headed. At that moment, out of the corner of his eyes, he suddenly saw a figure walking away from the crowd. That back view. It was the man he had seen in the portrait. Legendary mage. Ronan. No, no, no. This was impossible. I, I have to tell everyone this news. 
Ronan was not lost in the astral plane. He is still in the town. Jonas subconsciously struggled. However, he was completely lifted up by the garrison members. Then, he was mercilessly sent to prison. Rolling Stone Town, which was originally filled with joy, had its undercurrents surge again because of the brilliant fireworks. Hint, you have completed a large-scale bluff performance. You have mastered two basic elements of the deception domain, bluffing and trickery. Chapter 72, At the Touch of Fire In the hall that was reflecting rays of bright light, the arcane runes that activated long-range mirror image were extinguished one by one. Matthew blinked to adjust to the change in the light. It's over. You did well. Zeller walked over from the side. As he removed the rest of the mirror image spell, he signaled Matthew to relax. Matthew quickly took off his stiff cloak and could not help but ask, is this really going to work? The reason why he asked this was because he felt that he had not contributed much in the process just now. He was only disguised as Master Ronan and walked around the area that Zeller had planned out, trying to make himself look more like a legendary mage. Zeller explained the principle to him in advance. He would use the mirror image technique to present Ronan's image in Rolling Stone Town and the North-South Trade Post. At the same time, he ordered the others hiding at the scene to detonate the magic fireworks left behind by Ronan. Thanks to the strong festive atmosphere, most people would not notice Matthew pretending to be Ronan before the fireworks exploded. However, after the fireworks exploded, under everyone's conscious search, there was naturally no lack of observant people who would see Archmage Ronan. Then, everything else would follow. However, after the entire process ended, Matthew still had a strong sense of unreality. It's hard to say, but everything depends on one's actions. At least we've mudded the waters, haven't we? I still have some things to deal with. Give me a moment, please. Zeller smiled apologetically at Matthew. Then, he hurriedly walked to another side hall. Matthew had to remove his makeup himself. It was also at this moment that he suddenly received a notification from the system. The two elements of deception. Matthew touched his chin. Doesn't this mean that we've succeeded? Elements were the prerequisites for a domain. Under normal circumstances. If mortals wanted to dabble in a domain, they had to collect the elements of the relevant domain in advance. The more relevant elements they collected, the higher the possibility of them entering the domain. Elements were the key to accessing domains. But this didn't mean that it was the entirety of the domain. For example, Matthew had completely ignored the key and directly barged into the domain three times already. It could be seen how convenient the system was. Especially after unlocking the legendary path. Matthew could clearly feel that his entry into the domains was thousands of times simpler than others. Even this time. If it were anyone else, it would at most be a meaningful deception. Experience. Although Matthew did not directly step into the domain of deception, he had indirectly grasped two keys to the domain of deception. If he worked hard in this direction, he would have soon entered the domain of deception. According to Mage Ronan. Domains were more advanced tools than spells. Matthew gradually realized that his natural talent in the field might be his greatest strength. Next, I can focus on the three domains I have now. I can cultivate in the three domains and obtain more abilities in the respective domains. I can also expand horizontally and get involved in other related domains. As he pondered. Matthew had removed most of his makeup. Zeller rushed in. There's good news. It proves that our work is not for nothing. Matthew looked at him curiously. Zeller smiled. When we were setting off the fireworks, Blake captured a member of the Silver Frost Brotherhood. Matthew nodded. Our garrison captain is quite capable. How did he discover that the other party is a member of the Silver Frost Brotherhood? Zeller couldn't help but laugh. It's said that the criminal volunteered to participate in the Martin Run event and won first place. He ran so fast that people recognized him as a supernatural being at a glance. Was there such a thing? Matthew was stunned for three seconds. Then he must have accomplices, Matthew said. Zeller nodded and replied. This is obvious. The members of the Silverfrost Brotherhood usually work in groups of two. Although we haven't found his companions, we can be sure that he and his companions have seen Archmage Ronan with their own eyes. Especially when he was arrested, he reacted violently. He seemed to be eager to pass on this important news. To be honest, I'm currently wondering if I should find a chance to release him. Matthew thought for a moment. There's no need to be too deliberate. Zeller agreed. You're right. 
there are so many people present at the late spring festival. The news will definitely spread. In short, we're doing well so far. Thank you for your hard work, Matthew. Matthew shook his head. I didn't help much. Zeller said seriously, at least you're a real mage. This is very significant in the aspect of anti-divination. All right, your mission is over. Next, we will deal with the three evil organizations. If there is nothing else, we will not disturb you anymore. Of course, if you're willing, I would like to invite you to join the Lord's Mansion formally. Your status is temporarily the Lord's Magic Consultant, which is similar to my role. Matthew's heart jumped. Will Riagar agree? Chapter 73, At the Touch of Fire Zeller smiled. I will convince him. I'm very good at this. Matthew thought for a moment and threw out two more questions. If I become the advisor of the Lord's Manor, what do I need to do? How much is the reward? Zeller's invitation was obviously not a spur of the moment. After hearing Matthew's words, he said without hesitation. Usually nothing. When an incident occurs, you only need to provide related knowledge and assistance. As you can see, I am only a warlock. My understanding of magic is far inferior to that of mages. Rolling Stone Town has always been lacking a formal magic consultant, and I think you are the perfect candidate. As for the remuneration, it will not be less than 200 gold coins per month for the first year. We will reevaluate it based on your contributions in the past year, but the remuneration will only increase and not decrease. If the intensity of the work was as easy as what he said, then the pay was quite generous. However, Matthew did not agree immediately. He only nodded. I will consider it carefully. That should be the case. However, I still hope to have the opportunity to continue working with you. Zeller smiled and snapped his fingers. In the mirror. Lesna timidly looked at the two of them while leaning against her glasses. Charge this staff. Zeller handed the item over. Lesna took the staff, and her face blushed. Okay, please wait a moment. After a while. Her fiery figure appeared in the mirror again, but the flush on her face was even more obvious. Here. Matthew took the cough staff and was delighted to find that the staff had become charged and could be used at any time. The only strange thing was. When Matthew first took the staff, it felt a little wet and warm. Thank you. He didn't ask how the succubus charged the staff. After chatting with Zeller for a while more. Matthew got up and left the Lord's Mansion. It was the afternoon, and there was still a commotion outside. Matthew brought Soldier around the town for a whole afternoon. After experiencing the rare festive atmosphere, he hurried back to the oak forest. At dusk, Matthew's busy figure once again appeared near the pit in the northern wasteland. He had no choice. No matter how late it was, he had to make up for the work he missed during the day. There were only four days left until the temporary state of double harvest ended. In the next four days, nothing could stop Matthew from planting trees with all his might. Night fell. In an abandoned mine northeast of Rolling Stone Town. The sparkles of torches illuminated the dark and damp mine pit. Shadows of different heights and sizes swayed along with the light. These shadows reflected on the rock walls of the pit, looking exceptionally ferocious. The rustling sounds of discussion and the increasingly loud quarrels echoed in the cave for a long time. Ronan can't be here. A dull voice instantly drowned out the other noises. It was a young man with a greasy face and a torch in his right hand. He was wearing a grayish-brown robe and his entire body was enveloped in a faint black light, which added a hint of evil to him. I swear in the name of my lord that Ronan's true body is definitely trapped in the astral plane. This is a fact that has been verified by many parties. The man's eyes looked around fiercely. His eyes were filled with undisguised malice, and those who were stared at by him would involuntarily have their hair stand on end. However, there were also people who were not afraid of him. A slender black panther walked out gracefully. Her voice was hoarse and magnetic, and it instantly attracted the attention of all the male creatures present. But we all saw Ronan with our own eyes. Anderson, before the evil god behind you shows his true sincerity, everyone will only believe their own eyes no east om. Anderson glared at Black Panther with an unfriendly gaze. You'd better use the right words, Quina. My lord is not an evil god. He has lived in the heavenly palace for a long time and was once the ruler of this land. Quina sneered. Every evil art master firmly believes that their master is the true god of the heavenly palace. You'd better show us something practical. In order to cooperate with your damn ritual, 
we've already lost the initiative. Rolling Stone Town has strengthened its defenses, and everyone is now in a passive position. What you should do now is, to be honest, and not continue to hide. This is not beneficial to our cooperation. As soon as she said this, she immediately received a lot of resonance. In the shadows. Leon from the Silver Frost Brotherhood took a step forward. Madam Quinna is not wrong. The declaration of war was your order's suggestion. We've already cooperated with you and done a lot of work. Now that our brothers have infiltrated the town but we've discovered that Ronan might still be in town. Legendary mages are no joke. I also heard that the Lord of Rolling Stone Town has sent people to seek the support of a legendary monk. I'm afraid none of us wants to face such a threat. The others also agreed. The people of the three major organizations were not united. They were incited by Anderson, the Southern Patriarch of the Order of Calamity, to imitate the plundering ritual of the Age of Enlightenment and reap benefits from all sides by destroying Rolling Stone Town. Their main goal was the Path of Legend. Whether it was the arsonist, the witherer, or the evil art master, if they could personally participate in the destruction of a territory of order and good, it would benefit them endlessly. However, Rolling Stone Town was obviously different from that of the average poor and remote village. Chapter 74, At the Touch of Fire under Blake's lead. The garrison had greatly strengthened the patrols and inspections at the North-South Trade Post and Rolling Stone Town. This greatly increased the difficulty of the evil organization members sneaking in. Even if they managed to sneak in, most people had to give up their weapons to fit in. This was one of the difficulties Leon mentioned. Even if they were inside the town, they were barehanded. How were they going to do anything? The news that Ronan was still suspected to be in Rolling Stone Town became the final fuse. These evil people were not stupid. They were much better than ordinary people in terms of adapting to the situation. Even if something felt a little wrong, they would rather retreat first and then watch. No one was willing to be the first to die. The mine was gradually filled with quarrels and accusations. The members of the three major organizations argued for a long time, but no one was willing to complete the most important activation ceremony. Enough. Anderson shouted angrily. I knew that it would be difficult to accomplish anything with a bunch of motley crew like you. Fortunately, I didn't count on you from the beginning. His cold, venomous gaze swept across the crowd. Firstly, shut your mouths. Your equipment and weapons will arrive soon. Secondly, I'll personally conduct the activation ceremony. After tomorrow, I'll let the shadow of fear fill the sky above Rolling Stone Town. I hope you weaklings won't find any other excuses. And then I have to emphasize again. Ronan is trapped in the astral plane. This is the news that my lord personally told me. If you don't believe me, you can verify it yourself. You should have a channel to verify it. Finally, you should fight for the legendary path that you want and not grumble like a group of chickens. Anderson said as he walked out of the crowd. He opened his hands and suddenly began to chant a spell loudly. Everyone immediately retreated vigilantly. Anderson's spell took effect extremely quickly. After a while, in the next moment, almost transparent jelly-like living creatures appeared in the open space in front of him. Molting gel. Quinna's voice was solemn as she took seven steps back. Now, I'll go to the farm to look for a few unlucky experiment subjects. Those who have the guts, come with me. As he spoke. Anderson waved his hand. The staff in his hand shot out black shadows. In the blink of an eye. The dozen or so molting gels on the ground were put into wooden boxes that appeared out of thin air. In the shadows, a group of short figures rushed out. They struggled to lift the box and followed behind evil art master Anderson. Everyone saw clearly that it was a group of kobolds. What do we say now? Let him enjoy the rewards of the activation ceremony alone. Seeing Anderson's tenacious determination, the evil organization members wavered again. Some of them even began to calculate the benefits of the activation ceremony. At the very least, we should go and take a look. Anderson was the only member of the Order of Natural Disaster who had come today. The others probably had other plans. Quinna's eyes flickered as she said, I don't remember there ever being any kobolds under the command of the Order of Calamity. In the mine. Everyone discussed for a while and became restless again. They planned to follow him from a distance and observe the situation. They had only taken a few steps. Where did Anderson say he was going to find the unlucky subjects? Leon replied casually, A farm. Damn it. Quinna straightened her claws. There's an oak forest on the way from here to the farm. Leon was still confused. 
And then? Is there a flower fairy living in the oak forest? He even made a small joke. No, I didn't. It's all right now. Quinna seemed to have thought of something, and her posture became relaxed again. In the next second. She quickened her pace impatiently. Keep up. If we're late, there won't be any fun to watch. North of the Oak Forest. The five Silver Moon zombies were still working hard. Matthew quietly put down his shovel. His eyes were fixed on the north. Eli appeared out of nowhere and stood beside him. There is an evil smell, and it is unprecedentedly strong. They are coming. Following Eli's warning. A series of shadows of varying heights walked out from the entrance of a mine ahead. At this moment, dark clouds were drifting past, covering the bright moonlight. But at that moment, both sides saw each other. The atmosphere suddenly became tense. The battle was about to start. Chapter 75, Kill Hint, you have encountered the evil arts master Anderson, LV-15, and 33 Kobolds. Almost at the same time when the two sides met. Matthew shouted loudly. Ella. Miss Owl, who was doing an enlightenment ceremony for the Oak Forest, heard Matthew's call and flew southwest without saying a word. That was the location where Matthew and Blake had agreed to set up a new sentry post. Seeing Ella leave safely to report the situation, Matthew heaved a sigh of relief. He didn't have time to change his robe. He quickly took out the defensive psalm and held it in his left hand. He put the cough staff and the withered wood staff on his waist so that he could use them at any time. Eli's reaction was even more extreme. He glared with his eyes wide open and pounced forward on all fours. His entire body expanded, and with a roar, a tall and mighty saber-toothed tiger appeared on the barren land under the moonlight. He actually pounced straight at the enemy. Ambush battles always caught people off guard, but Anderson's reaction was quick. He shook off the cloak on his back and took out a huge mace from his back. The mace emitted a dark red, evil luster. Under his orders, the kobolds people swarmed out. They charged Eli with their small wooden sticks and small round shields. Matthew keenly noticed that some of the kobolds were holding wooden boxes in their hands. Compared to normal kobolds, their eyeballs were more prominent. Their eyes were bloodshot and had a strange luster similar to Anderson's hammer. Roar! Eli bravely charged into the crowd of kobolds. His body size was enough to crush these small and medium-sized creatures. The saber-toothed tiger pounced, raised its fangs and swept its tail. Immediately, three to four kobolds died. However, something unexpected happened. The kobolds, who were known for their tendency to flee when their morale was low, displayed illogical bravery. The death of their companion did not make them afraid. Instead, they continued to search at Eli fearlessly. Eli was strong and would not be hurt by the kobolds. However, there were too many kobolds. With the support of courage, even the ferocious saber-toothed tiger had to circle around them. It was not easy to attack them head-on. A few seconds later, Anderson himself also joined the battle with the dog-headed people. He waved his huge mace and shouted something. The evil art master's incantation was complicated and obscure. He chanted it quickly and incoherently. Matthew did not even have the chance to interrupt it with his cough staff. Anderson had already ended the casting phase. Matthew could only vaguely determine that he had used a total of three spells. The first spell was the summoning of a magic pet. Black smoke rose from the moon, and a demon that looked like a hyena with sharp barbs on its tail quietly appeared. Susova Magic Hound Elite slash LV-10 an abyssal creature, a mid-level demon, usually accompanied by elite gnolls. Just as the information about this summoned creature appeared in front of Matthew's eyes. He had also completed his summoning. The glow of the undying contract gradually dimmed. A torn skeleton appeared in front of Matthew. Matthew, what's the meaning of this? I was just listening to some music at home. Peggy grumbled, and then she saw the situation in front of her. She pulled out her bone blade and said, who should I chop? Matthew pointed at the sus of a magic hound that was running toward him. Peggy immediately went up and fought with the demon dog. On the other side. Due to Eli's reckless advance, his position was held back by the kobolds. Matthew had just commanded the Silver Moon zombies to reinforce him when the evil arts master Anderson had reached the saber-toothed tiger with his mace. At this moment, Matthew could also tell that the second spell that Anderson cast was a kind of power infusion or physique strengthening spell that originated from his evil god. This was because he saw Anderson's body expanding at a speed visible to the naked eye. Thrust. The black, 
thorn-like hair tore through the evil art master's robe. As his body size soared, evil art master Anderson also revealed his hideous appearance. The illusion of human appearance was broken. Under the moonlight, he became a giant knoll that was two meters tall and had abnormally bulging muscles. Die, T. The huge knoll smashed the saber-toothed tiger's waist with its mace. Eli couldn't dodge it completely. He was hit from the side and immediately screamed. Seeing this, the kobolds attacked even harder. Even though the Silver Moon zombies had already rushed to the vicinity to support Eli, Anderson's target, Eli, was in a sorry state. The latter did not expect this evil art master to have the terrifying close combat ability of a knoll. Anderson kept waving his mace. Eli was slowly being cornered. Helpless. Eli could only hurriedly cast two buffs on himself. Then, he prepared to wait for an opportunity to escape. Matthew was also preparing to support Eli. He took out his withered wood staff and aimed it at Anderson's back. At this moment, the evil art master seemed to be wholly focused on chasing after Eli, completely unconcerned about what was happening behind him. All signs indicated that this was the best time to launch a sneak attack. Matthew gripped his withered wood staff tightly. He was indeed preparing to cast the strongest single target spell he could cast Enhanced Exhaustion Ray. However, at this critical moment, he suddenly remembered the third spell that Anderson had chanted. I'm a caster, so it's illogical for him to ignore me. He had cast three spells, so what was the last one? What was the third spell? Matthew stared at Anderson's back, which was emitting red light, and chanted rapidly. A second later, cold air burst out from the tip of the withered wood staff. Immediately after. Then, a one-meter-long ball of white cold air enveloped Anderson's body. Whoosh! A red light flashed on Anderson's body. The white mist instantly disappeared. Matthew felt a sharp pain in the palm of his hand that was holding the magic staff. A slight sense of nausea quickly rose in his heart. Hint, you have used the rank Ocantrop Frost Mist on evil mage Anderson. You have suffered Anderson's counterspell, magic contract enhanced. Your Frost Mist has lost its effect. You will suffer the punishment of being countered. For 12 minutes, you will not be able to cast any spell of the same level as Frost Mist. Your Focus 0.5, lasts for 18 seconds. Hint, you have successfully identified and used a rank Ocantrop to break the enemy's counterspell. You will soon have the opportunity to explore the elements of the battle domain. I knew there was something else. And it's a counterspell that was strengthened by his evil god. Matthew was secretly glad that he had sensed that something was wrong. If he had used a tier 2 spell, the punishment he would have to endure would probably destroy him. Ever since Matthew had transmigrated, he had hardly fought with a proper spell caster. This was his first time. As expected, actual combat was different from theory. If Matthew had not been cautious enough, this vicious counterspell would have definitely made him suffer. This planned counterspell also made Matthew realize that Anderson's target from the beginning was him. As expected. After sensing that Matthew had been punished by the law, Anderson turned around. He brandished the mace and quickly launched a surprise attack in Matthew's direction. The kobolds ran even faster. A small portion of them went past the Silver Moon zombies and charged towards Matthew. The rest of them were fighting with the zombies. Seeing this, Eli hurriedly prepared to run back to support Matthew. However, there was already some distance between the two sides. He could only barely catch up to some of the kobolds who were lagging behind. Hiss hiss hiss. Even Susova's hound, who was fighting with Peggy, found an opportunity to shake her off. This cunning demon sped up and wanted to attack Matthew from the other side. At the crucial moment, Peggy suddenly took a step forward and threw a bone blade in front of her. Puff. The bone blade that left her hand easily tore the demon dog's head apart. The demon immediately convulsed and fell to the ground. Brain matter and blood mixed together and gushed out from the hole that had been cut open by the bone blade. She couldn't be bothered to deal with the demon dog. Peggy pulled out her bone blade and went to Matthew's side to protect him. Don't be afraid. With me here, no one can hurt you. The soul fire in her brain was burning brightly. Her golden bones gradually turned into a noble dark gold under the moonlight. A gratified smile flashed across Matthew's face. However, his attention was still focused on the knoll evil art master who was charging at him. In the next moment, he gripped the withered wood staff tightly and focused his attention. He aimed at Anderson's tall body and fired a solid enhanced exhaustion ray. Anderson took the ray full of negative energy head-on. 
its body size had almost shrunk by a portion. Under the weakening of the exhaustion ray. Not only was Anderson's life slowly fading, but his powerful attributes were also slowly decreasing. However, he did not stop his assault. The cobalts at the front had already started fighting with Peggy. Fortunately, Matthew's reinforcements had also arrived. The skeleton dormitory was not far from here. Matthew used the summoning of the dead to summon twelve skeleton soldiers at the start of the battle. Now, they had finally arrived and surrounded Matthew in the middle. These bones can't protect you. Anderson roared as he charged over. His powerful mace smashed into Peggy, shattering her arm bones and sternum, causing her to stagger to the side. This tier 4 evil art master's close combat ability was evident. Matthew stared at Anderson. He quickly took two steps back. He aimed the withered wood staff in his hand at his opponent again. Whoosh! A grey light flashed. Hint, you have used the negative armor spell on evil art master Anderson. Anderson's armor, bio fur, has been weakened to dash one. Your spells can't hurt me. Anderson swept the area with force again. Two skeleton soldiers were sent flying by him. At this moment, there were less than twenty steps between him and Matthew. However, when he saw Matthew's face under the moonlight, Anderson couldn't help but feel surprised. Because there was a confident and calm smile. It was now. Kill him. Matthew whispered. In the shadows that no one could see clearly, a skeleton with his hips twisting appeared silently behind the tall knoll. Anderson didn't have time to turn around. Firefly and Bright Moon had already landed impatiently on his thick neck. The blade went in as if it was kissing a lover's skin. Stab! Blood splattered before the sound. His head fell to the ground with a miserable cry. Under the moonlight. The giant knoll's head rolled on the ground like a ball on the beach. It happened to roll in front of Matthew. Matthew lifted his leg. He stepped on it heavily. Coincidentally, at this moment, another group of figures came out of the cave. They watched in shock as Matthew stepped on Anderson's head. His eyeballs squeezed out of the eye sockets. Blood splattered up half a meter. It dyed the necromancer's shoes and clothes red under the moonlight. Chapter 76, Banishment Letter At the entrance of the mine, Quinna watched in disbelief as Matthew stepped on Anderson's head. Of course, she knew that there was a strange necromancer living in the oak forest, and she suspected that he was the one who had the ability to summon bone dragons. However, she did not expect Anderson to be defeated so quickly. He was the southern patriarch of the Order of Calamity, a genuine tier 4 evil arts master, the organizer of the three organizations expedition, and the strongest among them. This scene also shocked the other members. Their originally unstable fighting spirit instantly melted away like melting snow. Many people subconsciously retreated, wanting to hide behind the others. In the end, they realized that everyone had retreated. After Anderson's head fell to the ground, the situation on the battlefield also became clear. The originally fearless kobolds all covered their heads and scurried towards the entrance of the cave. However, their escape route was blocked by Eli. The saber-toothed tiger showed off its might as he dealt with the escaping kobolds. One slap, one kill. Soon. All the kobolds were eliminated. The only fish that had escaped the net was the Susova demon hound. This demon's vitality was shockingly tenacious. Even though Peggy had punctured its skull and a small amount of brain matter was leaking out, it still managed to stumble away. This scene fell into Matthew's eyes. He frowned. The Susova demon hound is a creature from another world. After the Noel dies, it should not be able to maintain its existence in the prime material plane. Almost at the same time. Suddenly, a violent tremor came from under his feet. Matthew reacted quickly. He lifted his leg and launched a heavy kick. Bang! Anderson's head exploded in the air, turning into a strange blood mist. Matthew saw it clearly. There were human faces, bugs, brain grooves, and clusters of extremely evil runes in the blood mist. At the same time, the badge of the goddess of moonlight on his chest began to tremble violently. Retreat! Matthew growled. Under cover of the skeletons, they quickly left the blood mist and the headless corpse. The blood mist wrapped the knoll's corpse like an octopus. In the next moment, a solemn voice came from the blood mist. That person's words were extremely rigid and clear. It was as if it was echoing in the hearts of everyone present. I'll grant you an undying body. Wherever the night goes, you'll live endlessly and be indestructible. As soon as he finished speaking, 
the headless corpse of the knoll slowly stood up from the ground. Unknowingly. A smooth neck grew out from the undamaged head. Everyone was stunned by this strange scene. Even for the members of the evil organization, such a scene of resurrection was extremely rare. He he he, I'm immortal. Anderson shook his neck from side to side as if he was trying to get used to this new head. His eyes were evil and unscrupulous as he locked onto Matthew as if he wanted to swallow him alive. The blood mist still hadn't disnursed. It was like a protective halo that enveloped the knoll. Matthew sensed a strong domain from the blood mist. At this moment, a message formed by moonlight suddenly appeared on the constantly vibrating batch. The god of the Noel Anderson is the evil demon Trier of the ancient land, and Trier is actually the incarnation of the god of midnight. The blessing of the god of midnight is only effective at midnight. If it is delayed until dawn, his undying blessing will be broken. Asha Moonlight The Midnight God? Was this matter actually related to the Heavenly Palace? Matthew didn't doubt the authenticity of this information. After all, this was in line with the Goddess of Moonlight's many attempts to curry favor with him. Even if she had any designs on him, it would be something else. However, whether it was Asha or the God of Midnight who had transformed a man into an evil spirit, it meant that the exiled gods had started to make their move. This was not good news for this world that was lagging behind in development. This thought flashed through Matthew's mind. He suddenly pulled out a crossbow and aimed it at Anderson, who was in the blood mist. Come on. You can't kill me. Anderson shouted crazily. Matthew judged that he was still in a temporary state of paralysis after being resurrected, so he no longer hesitated. An arrow shot out from the pile of skeleton soldiers and hit Anderson in the chest. The arrow pierced the knoll's chest, and the knoll pulled it out as if it did not feel pain. It then twisted the arrow in half in front of Matthew. However, Matthew did not stop. He raised his hand and swiftly took out another loaded crossbow from his magical bag and aimed it at Anderson. Whoosh! Another arrow. Anderson glared angrily. You're doing useless work. He had just pulled out the second arrow from his chest when the third arrow flew over. However, Matthew missed this time, and the arrow pierced the knoll's knee. The three consecutive arrows made him furious. The blood mist began to move slowly toward Matthew. However, Matthew, who had missed his three shots, sneakily retreated towards the oak forest. He met up with Eli. With the Silver Moon zombies and skeleton soldiers as protection, they retreated in an orderly manner. Only soldier was ordered by Matthew to harass the evil art masters in the blood mist. After receiving the order, soldier immediately limped towards Anderson. His dance steps were sometimes stiff and sometimes smooth. Everyone saw the skeleton that was always twisting its hips around the blood mist in a probing manner. From time to time, he would strike. The short knife could easily tear open the skin of the knoll, leaving a mark on his body that was neither deep nor shallow. However, the effect was limited. The blood mist seemed to have given Anderson an insufferably vibrant life force. No matter how Soldier added wounds to his body, he could always recover quickly, and his aura became stronger and stronger. This Knoll's close combat ability is too strong said Eli fearfully. I'm afraid that only guardians of the same level can take him head on. Ordinary warriors can't do anything to him. Matthew nodded lightly. Peggy and Eli were both tier 3 melee experts, but they were barely a match for Anderson. The pressure that this guy gave off on the battlefield was indeed too great. He had seen through this, which was why he had chosen to lure the enemy in and cooperate with soldiers' sneak attack. However, who knew that an evil art master actually had the protection of a true god? Even though the Heavenly Palace was far away and the God of Midnight could not directly interfere on the battlefield, the blessing he gave through his avatar was already troublesome enough. Eli, I need you to cooperate with my skeleton assassin and continue to pressure him. I'll give you some support from behind. Matthew voiced his thoughts. Eli didn't refuse. He just asked curiously, he's immortal now. What's the use of your crossbow and our harassment? I'm not thinking of killing him now. I'm just trying to weaken him as much as possible. Matthew said calmly, didn't you notice that his movements are much slower than before? Eli was enlightened. Are you using poisoned arrows? Matthew nodded. It seems that his immortal body is not omnipotent. The effects of the powerful exhaustion ray and the negative armor debuff have been purified, but the poison on the crossbow will still slow him down. This is not enough to kill him. We are facing a protracted battle. Eli took a deep breath. I understand. You need me to force him to use his other abilities. Matthew's eyes flashed with caution. 
Yes, while the others are still hesitating, try your best to put pressure on him. I suspect that he still has a powerful killing move other than resurrection, so you have to be careful. Anderson was the strongest enemy Matthew had ever faced since he transmigrated. Because it was an ambush, both sides were almost unprepared. The attack just now was the best decision Matthew made on the spot. Things had come to this. Matthew didn't have many cards in his hand, and he definitely couldn't use his trump card, Bone Dragon, for two reasons. First, revealing his trump card meant that he had to be prepared to escape. Clearly, he had not reached that step yet. Second, Matthew's trump card was actually a non-secret. The Order of Calamity was aware of the existence of the Skeletal Dragon, but they still dared to come and cause trouble. This meant that they had the means to fight the Skeletal Dragon. In such a situation, showing his cards first was equivalent to sending himself to his death. Matthew had to rely on other methods to delay Anderson. At this moment, his gaze was locked onto the Noel Evil Art Master. His attention was unprecedentedly focused, and he did not want to miss a single detail. Eli understood Matthew's tactics. He switched from his wild form to a more agile jungle lynx, and he worked with Soldier to Harris Anderson. The injured Peggy was in charge of supporting them from further away. Matthew, on the other hand, kept retreating at a moderate pace. In the blood mist, Anderson was pincered from both front and back. Even though his recovery ability was amazing, he was still harassed tirelessly. The spiked hammer in his hand was extremely lethal, but it just couldn't hit Soldier and Eli. The former's footsteps were strange. He was clearly a skeleton, but his movements were as slippery as an earthworm. After the latter transformed into a lynx, his agility skyrocketed. Furthermore, Eli did not focus on attacking but on harassing. He didn't give Anderson any chance to hurt him. The group retreated while fighting. They gradually approached the edge of the oak forest. Finally, Anderson also realized that his movements were a little too slow. He cast purification on himself to temporarily suppress the poison. The blood mist dispersed bit by bit. He seemed to have been completely freed from the stun of resurrection. Suddenly, he rushed forward and almost injured Eli, but Soldier, under Matthew's command, pounced behind Anderson like a ghost. Firefly and Bright Moon were about to repeat the same trick. But this time, Anderson dodged at the last moment. The pair of daggers only tore through the Noel's scalp and did not decapitate it again. Unable to succeed, Soldier quickly blended into the shadows. Anderson's face was flushed red from the tactic. He finally couldn't hold it in anymore. Under Matthew's scorching gaze, the knoll tore off a palm-sized piece of fur from its chest. The back of the fur was filled with twisted words. Anderson held the fur in his hand and glared in the direction where Soldier disappeared. He shouted. You don't belong here. As he spoke, that piece of fur actually started to burn out of thin air. Soldier's figure suddenly appeared. His movements were a little stiff at first and then a dark grey negative energy halo lit up under his feet. You don't belong here. Anderson roared again. The halo completely engulfed Soldier. Hint, the evil art master Anderson has used the banishment letter on your summoned creature. Soldier has been banished for a short period of time. Currently, Soldier is in the negative energy plane. Time limit before you can summon Soldier again, 4 hours. Banishment letter. Magic contract enhancement and exile spell stained with the blood of the great demon Trier. It can banish any non-legendary creature from the material world for a short period of time. The duration depends on the level of the banished subject and the will of the summoner. Soldier was banished. Anderson had completely regained his spirit, and his movements became faster and faster. The pressure on Eli instantly increased a lot. Anderson used his hammer to force Eli back. Then, he charged toward Matthew without any regard for anything else. However, Matthew's eyes flashed with indescribable excitement. So, the banishment document is your trump card against the Bone Dragon. He was not in a hurry to attack. Instead, he ordered the skeleton soldiers and zombies to disperse. He quickly ran towards the oak forest. In the forest, the sound of horse hooves could be heard. Matthew ran with a smile on his face. He knew. He was definitely not fighting alone. Chapter 77, The Southern Four The significance of the sentry post was vividly reflected in this battle. Matthew had never thought of fighting against the three evil organizations on his own, and so after the failed ambush, his tactics immediately changed to delaying and probing. And Ella didn't disappoint. Amidst the sound of horse hooves, 
a total of eight cavalrymen had successfully arrived in front of Matthew. The leader of the group was Blake, who was fully armed, and Zeller, who was dressed in casual clothes. The remaining six knights were also armed to the teeth. Matthew knew that they were not members of the garrison but the Lord's guards. His lordship already knows. He ordered me to come over first, and follow-up reinforcements are already on the way. Zeller dismounted and stood beside Matthew. The knights, on the other hand, were slowly advancing with their spears in their hands. Under the night sky. The three-meter-long spear gave off an extremely oppressive feeling. This was a real military weapon. Even Anderson, who thought highly of himself, was no longer arrogant. He did not dare to continue chasing but hurriedly retreated to the entrance of the mine. Blake and the others were about to give chase. Matthew quickly reminded them, be careful. Those wooden boxes are strange. Hearing this, the knights hurriedly tightened their reins. The moonlight shone on the barren land in front of them. There were more than ten wooden boxes scattered around the corpses of the kobolds. A few of the boxes had been knocked open by the fall, and they looked empty. However, Matthew's nerves were beating violently. Be careful. It's molting gel. Do you have sight powder? He saw the notification. He knew that the monster in the wooden box had sneaked over under the cover of the night and in its unique form. Without saying a word, Zeller threw a glass bottle at the empty space in front of him. With a bang, the bottle shattered, and light purple smoke spread out from it. Wherever the smoke went, some of the molting gel that was originally difficult to distinguish with the naked eye was instantly dyed with a thick layer of purple. This was sight powder, a powerful tool for mid- and low-level adventurers to fight against invisible units. The disadvantage was that it was expensive, and even Matthew could not afford it. The fastest molting gel was already close to its position. The horse at the front suddenly raised its front hooves in shock and neighed. The knight managed to maintain his balance and pulled the reins to the side. Blake reacted quickly and stabbed his spear forward. The iron spear easily pierced through the jelly-like body of the molting gel, but the latter was only nailed to the ground and could not move. It seemed that it was not dead. We can't kill them like this. We need fire or lightning, or we can just dry the water in their bodies. As a mage. Matthew's basic skills were still passable. The molting gel was a kind of sludge-like monster, and its form was transparent and jelly-like. Their movement speed was not fast, but they were also extremely easy to miss. Once a living creature accidentally touches the molting gel, the gel will rapidly expand and engulf the living creature at the fastest speed. The person wrapped in the molting gel will suffer great pain for 72 hours. They will not be able to escape or struggle and can only await the arrival of death. Their flesh, blood, internal organs and even bones would be easily digested by the molting gel, leaving behind only a few strands of hair and complete human skin. The molting gel would spit out the human skin and hair after digestion. After leaving it in place, it would set off to look for the next prey. It was precisely because of this characteristic that some evil spellcasters or organizations would store molting gel and use it to skin themselves. Of course, there were many examples in history where they were accidentally eaten alive because of the molting gel. This thing was far from being as clumsy and harmless as it looked. Matthew reminded everyone. Everyone began to eliminate the molting gel. Zeller also carefully calculated the number of wooden boxes to prevent any of the molting gel from getting away and harming the residents nearby. Matthew took advantage of this opportunity to cast the undead summoning spell on the pile of cobalt corpses. Hint, undead summoning has been successfully cast. You have obtained 30 silver moon cobalt zombies, average level 6. You have obtained 3 cobalt skeleton soldiers, average level 0. After a round of summoning, Matthew's mana was mostly depleted. The kobolds who had been fighting for the Order of Calamity instantly turned into undead and turned against them. Other than three whose corpses were too damaged by Eli and thus could only be revived as skeletons, the rest of the kobolds were all transformed into Silver Moon zombies. Compared to the Silver Moon zombies transformed from humans, these undead kobolds were smaller in size and lower in level, but they also inherited the characteristics of Bark Spell, Moonlight Power, and Holy Moon Armor. Other than their reduced agility, they were stronger than living kobolds in all other aspects. This was the first time Matthew had controlled so many undead creatures at the same time. However, he did not feel flustered. Instead, it felt like he was playing an RTS game. He drew a frame in his mind and ordered the kobolds to attack, defend, or idle. Easy orders could usually be carried out smoothly, but it was difficult to give more detailed instructions. If he wanted to carry out more detailed microcontrol, 
Matthew had to learn the magic skills related to group control. With the help of the cobalt zombies, he cleaned up the molting gel. The pressure on the knights was instantly reduced. They turned their attention to the entrance of the mine. Chapter 78, The Southern Foreman Team At this moment, the people at the entrance also had a fierce argument with Anderson. We've been discovered by the officials of Rolling Stone Town. That evil necromancer doesn't look like someone to be trifled with. We don't have any weapons, and we lack manpower. It's time to admit that this operation failed. A one-eyed man said this and walked into the mine without looking back. Although the others did not say it explicitly, they all agreed with his opinion. Only Anderson's eyes were gloomy and burning with anger, but he had no intention of retreating. Quinna and Leon looked at each other. Both of them sensed that something was amiss. However, there were a few knights outside the cave who had already bypassed the remaining molting gel and were chasing after them. Their eyes revealed the intention to retreat. For the members of the evil organization, the courage to admit defeat and know how to protect themselves was the highest principle of survival. If Anderson and the Order of Calamity could really tear open the wounds of Rolling Stone Town through the activation ceremony and cause panic there, they would not mind adding icing on the cake and joining forces with the Order of Calamity to carry out a party of evil organizations in Rolling Stone Town. However, the current situation was different. Rolling Stone Town was harder to deal with than they had imagined. Then they had better leave. That was the best plan. More and more people retreated into the cave. A mocking smile appeared on Anderson's face. Quinna and Leon frowned and walked into the cave. But not long after. The people who had left earlier suddenly ran out of the cave. Move aside. A rough voice came from the depths of the cave. Several peripheral members of the Silver Frost Brotherhood were unable to dodge in time and were sent flying to the stone wall by a huge force. Boom. 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 The entire mine cave shook violently. Everyone was forced to regroup at the entrance of the cave in shock. Another feminine voice sounded, How many times have I told you not to hammer people into the wall? The soil here is soft. If you're not careful, you'll be buried alive. Accompanied by a voice. A dark-skinned, slim female drow walked out of the shadows. She had very little fabric on her body and could barely protect her vital parts. Other than her hot figure, the thing that attracted everyone's attention the most was the scimitars hanging on both sides of her long thighs. The curved edge of the scimitar was very wide, and the edge of the scimitar flickered with silver light. There was no doubt that this was a drow warrior with extraordinary combat strength. Behind her, a troll with dark blue skin and a head that almost reached the ceiling OT the cave was walking lazily. Compared to a normal troll. The most special thing about this troll was that he was too fat. He alone almost filled the entire tunnel. It was clearly this troll who sent the gang members flying. Hey, little girl, it doesn't matter how many times you tell Sinwok. The troll threw a tantrum at the drow warrior and said, Sinwok's memory lasts for 17 seconds at most. It's useless for you to tell him this. It's useless. The drow warrior rolled her eyes. She couldn't be bothered to waste her breath on this idiot. Everyone was forced out of the cave. They watched as the fat troll struggled to squeeze its body out of the hole and fell to the side. Boom. The ground trembled slightly. The troll lay on the ground and moaned comfortably. Sinwok, you're the most self-aware troll I've ever seen, but please tell me in advance the next time you lie down. I have a phobia of earthquakes. Two more people walked out from behind the troll. The one who spoke was a Borman holding a huge axe. And the warrior beside him was even more eye-catching. He was not tall, and there was a circle of fine scales and a short horn on his forehead. He had a long tail on his back, and the scales on his tail were dark blue, emitting a strange luster in the night. Combined with his deep pupils, the identity of this warrior was obvious. He was a half-dragon or a draken. Warning, you have encountered the Order of Calamity's Southern Quartet. Headhunter Lara, Drow Warrior slash LV-15, Angry Mountain Sinwalk, Troll slash LV-14. 100 Manslayer Mehdi's, Draken Spellcaster slash LV-14. Deep Howling Butcher Benwen, Boar Warrior slash LV-14. You have encountered the Underground Coalition Army from the Abyss, Kobolds, Gnolls, Imps, Lesser Inferior Demons, etc. There are more than 300 of them. He looked at the lines of information. Matthew's eyelids twitched. He guessed that the Order of Calamity would not send Anderson alone. However, he did not expect the other party's reinforcements to be so fierce. It was fine if there were just four elite adventurers. 
but there was a whole army as well. I'm afraid this isn't a plundering ritual at all. The Church of Calamity wants to attack Rolling Stone Town. Zeller looked very serious. We might have misjudged the enemy's true purpose. Matthew was also on guard. He looked in the direction of the cave in the distance. Countless kobolds and gnolls were pouring out of the cave, and they were still giving weapons to the Silver Frost Brotherhood and the Withering Order. At this juncture, the other two organizations had no other choices. They were forced to join the Order of Calamity. War. At the very least, a small-scale battle was unavoidable. We might need to retreat first. Zeller suggested. Wait a moment. After Matthew said this, he stared in the direction of the cave entrance. Zeller followed his gaze. He saw evil art master Anderson cursing at his subordinates. Do it. Matthew suddenly whispered. The air around Anderson twisted, and several half-broken bottles smashed into his body and feet. In the next second, the gnoll's head, back, and chest suddenly burst into flames. Who is it? The gnoll roared angrily and smashed the mace in its hand, but it missed. Peggy, who had sneaked in and succeeded in her attack, ran quickly. Before Anderson could react, the Torrin skeleton had already run far away. Only the others were left to put out the fire in a hurry. However, what Peggy used were the blazing glue and Molotov cocktail that Matthew had obtained from the arsonist. Once the flame was ignited, it could not be contained. Moreover, Anderson's fur had become the best fuel. In just a few seconds. In the process of Anderson jumping up and down, his black fur was burnt clean. The strange blood mist appeared again. The resurrection power bestowed by the God of Midnight could save the gnoll's life and also have the opportunity to quickly regenerate his fur. However, the most important pieces of fur were no longer there. Hint, Paige used blazing glue to burn the gnoll's fur and two copies of banishment letters hidden in its chest hair. So you were still hiding your two more banishment letters. Such schemes. Matthew smiled in relief. In the next second. Just as Anderson furiously ordered his men to charge into the oak forest. A bright circle of light flashed across the open space in front of them. A mountain-sized skeleton appeared out of thin air. It turned its head and looked straight at the entrance of the cave. The soul fire in its skull was as terrifying as the lamp of the Grim Reaper. At that moment, everyone felt as if the sky was collapsing and the earth was shattering. Chapter 79, Changes in the Battle Fully entered the arena with the might of a dragon. In an instant, it intimidated the kobolds and gnolls who had just charged forward. The skeletal dragon slightly opened its wings, and its bony neck twisted in the air. In the next second, its jaw opened, and thick black smoke gushed out from its chest. Dragon breath. The dragon breath that was mixed with poison and acid shot out in a cone shape. The fan-shaped area in front of the skeletal dragon was covered in black smoke. The underground creatures at the front didn't even have the chance to scream before they were killed by the terrifying breath. Fully charged forward again. Boom. Fully's mountain-like body rolled over the barren land. Dozens of dead bodies appeared on the ground. It had made outstanding military achievements when it first appeared, but it was not greedy for credit. Seeing that the enemy's main force was fleeing in fear, it instead cautiously stood guard in place, only its head facing Matthew's direction, looking proud of itself. Fully's action was in line with Matthew's train of thought. The bone dragon was definitely a great weapon to kill small fries. However, the evil art masters, who were nearly invincible in close combat, and the newly arrived southern four-man team were deep behind the enemy formation. Their levels were not much different from the Bone Dragon, and if they rushed over rashly, there was a risk of being torn apart. Without the banishment letter, the battle will only drag on to our advantage. Matthew's train of thought was very clear. This was Rolling Stone Town, his home ground, and in a tug-of-war, the more corpses on the ground, the better for the necromancer. Therefore, he and Zeller quickly communicated for a while. The knights slowly drew back their formation in the direction of the oak forest. Everyone paid close attention to the changes in the enemy. At the entrance of the cave, over a hundred underground creatures were intimidated by the skeletal dragon and were running around like headless flies. Some of the weaker ones were even trampled to death by their companions. Seeing this scene, the few members of the Order of Calamity acted decisively. The burly Borman warrior carried a brown flag and rushed into the chaotic formation. With his physique, the underground creatures he bumped into along the way were sent flying. Just like that, the wild Borman knocked away more than ten kobolds and came to a relatively empty wasteland. The next moment, he suddenly stuck the flag into the ground in front of him. 
Hoya. The wild boar warrior patted the mane on his chest and let out a loud roar. The battle flag shook without wind. The halo spread through the battleground. The panicked underground creatures were relieved of their shock. At the same time, the dragon swordsman had been following him. When he saw the flag's effect activated, the half dragon pulled out a pitch black horn. Wee wee woo. The horn sounded. The underground creatures trembled when they heard the sound, and then they moved toward the direction of the flag. The fear in their eyes disappeared. What replaced it was a strong battle intent. Just like that. With a flag and a horn, the chaotic situation instantly calmed down. The army of the Order of Calamity had assembled once again. During this process, more and more underground creatures were coming out of the cave. More and more underground troops gathered on the barren land. Well done, Banwen, Mehdis. Anderson praised loudly. Then, he looked at the fat troll beside him. Sinwak, it's your turn. I know it'll be easy for you to take down that damned bone dragon. Who knew that the troll was lying comfortably on the ground? For a moment, he refused to get up. Shush. Sinwak isn't going anywhere. I'll just lie here and wait for the enemies to come before I tear them apart. Anderson couldn't help but berate, we are at war. For the sake of the great Yurkas, can't you rest after the match? The troll was indifferent. The great Yurkas didn't say that Sinwak couldn't lie down for a while. Sinwak had already rushed for half a day and successfully arrived at the battlefield. What else do you want Sinwak to do? Anderson was furious at his attitude. Don't make me beat you up, Sinwak. He raised the mace in his hand sternly. It doesn't matter. Sinwak's memory is only 17 seconds at most. The troll lay down lazily. Only two thick moss-covered buttocks were exposed, facing Anderson. Bang! Anderson was so angry that he smashed his hammer down, accurately hitting the troll's head. The latter's eyes turned white, and his body trembled. Then, a heavy snore sounded. Sinwak! Anderson was furious. Let him sleep for a while. Considering the age of the trolls, Sinwak is still a five-year-old child. The drow warrior beside him said casually. Anderson looked at her angrily. How long will he sleep? Lara tidied her hair. Who knows? Last time, he dared to sleep in front of the old black dragon and slept for a full eighty hours. The black dragon was so angry that it almost castrated him. I Jane Fortnatal of the black dragon's subordinates could not find the Sinwaks genitals. He's really too fat. I'm really worried about his future wife. Anderson was speechless. He glanced at the depths of the mine. So where is Black Dragon Aegis? Did he refuse to come? Lara said sarcastically, it's not like you don't know the old Black Dragon's character. When he was young, he fantasized about dominating the underground world. Later, after being defeated by the Dracolich and the Fire Tribe, he was scared out of his wits. To this day, he only wants to live a peaceful life with his hundreds of wives of different races. He's already giving the order face by lending his troops. Anderson said coldly. It's not like he doesn't have the intention of coveting the surface world. The reason why he doesn't want to come personally is because he's afraid of. Ronan. Lara said matter-of-factly, who isn't afraid of that lunatic Ronan? If it weren't for the fact that my lord had explicitly told me that Ronan was trapped in the astral plane, I would never have gotten involved in this mess. Anderson nodded. His tone was much gentler. Lara, do you see that bone dragon? It is a great enemy on the battlefield. I need you to kill that necromancer. This will greatly reduce our losses. Don't worry. I've already fought with that necromancer. His level isn't high, at most third tier. His bone dragon should have been obtained by chance. Who knew that Lara would quickly shake her head and refuse? My mission is to contact the old black dragon Aegis, mobilize the army, and protect your life. I won't do anything else. Anderson's blood pressure, which had just dropped, rose again. So, you plan to stand by and watch? Lara replied without hesitation, the purpose of my existence is to ensure that even if you are defeated, your corpse can be transported back to the Holy Church in a relatively complete state for resurrection. After all, this was a precious body bestowed by the gods. In all of the South, you are the only one with such an honor. I can't let your dead body be left outside. Anderson shook his head angrily, his mace clenched tightly. Lara was still expressionless. I thought you had already gotten used to life in the Order. It seems that your greatness still needs some growth. 
I advise you not to look at me like that. I'm not a stupid troll. If I feel threatened, I don't mind turning you into a corpse and bringing you back to the Holy Church in advance. As she spoke, her right hand was already on the scimitar on the outside of her thigh. Please, can't you show any of the Order's camaraderie and unity? Anderson, didn't you always say that we're a family? The wild Borman warriors guarding the battle flag in the distance seemed to have sensed the tense atmosphere. He complained loudly, besides, can't you control the two groups of people you've roped in? They've already run away. Anderson was stunned. He quickly looked in the direction the Borman warrior was pointing. The Silver Frost Brotherhood and the Order of Withering had scattered and fled after taking their weapons. But this time, they did not run into the mine. Instead, they retreated towards the northwest. One of them did not seem to be running away from Rolling Stone Town. Anderson shouted with a gloomy expression, Don't bother about them. Let's finish the battle quickly. Banwen, you and Mehdi's are old partners. You two can lead the team to take down the Bone Dragon. After receiving the affirmative reply from the Borman and the Draken, Anderson then ordered a strong knoll to lead a small army to bypass the main battlefield and sneak attack the farm next to it and to create as much chaos as possible. That's why. Amidst the troll, Sin walks deafening snores. The situation changed again. The underground coalition army launched its attack in an orderly manner. The Lord's Manor and the camp beside it were brightly lit. The sound of gathering footsteps could be heard. In a room. Sif, who was in her pajamas, looked worriedly at her father, who was getting armed. Must you go? Uncle Zeller and the other cousins and Blake can handle it, right? Riagar adjusted his armor and replied seriously. The people of the Suki family will not run away from the battle. When our people are threatened by invaders, the only thing we need to do is to kill them with our own hands. He thought for a moment and said. The battle is at the Oak Forest. Your teacher might be there too. Although I don't like him, I have to protect him. Sif bit her lip. But I'm also a member of the Suki family. I also want to go together. Riagar turned around and gently patted her head. The blood of the clan indeed flows in your veins. At some point in the future, you will step onto the battlefield like me and fight for things that are very important to you, but that is definitely not today. Sif broke free from his hand. But you're not even willing to teach me how to fight. I'm going to be 16 soon. You've been lying to me all this time. I know you only want to protect me, but I really don't want to live under your protection forever. Rigor was stunned for a moment. He bent down and gently grabbed his daughter's shoulder, his eyes bright. Fighting is not a difficult thing for the Blood Flag family. Sif, I swear to you that one day, you will become an outstanding warrior. But before that, my daughter, please let me protect you, okay? Sif pursed her lips and took a few deep breaths. She pushed Riagar away with tears in her eyes. I know, I know. I'm just worried about you, Uncle Zeller, and Matthew. I shouldn't have delayed you. I just couldn't control myself. You don't have to worry about me. Go. I promise you. I will stay safe in the house until you come back. Hurry. Hearing Sif's promise, Riagar smiled in relief. He put on his helmet and took a heavy two-handed sword from the wall. He carried it on his shoulder and walked out quickly. Very quickly. Outside the camp. Under the leadership of Riagar. The Knights of the Lord's Guards rushed in the direction of the Oak Forest in an orderly manner. Just as the last team disappeared from the front of the Lord's residence. In an alley opposite. A few sneaky figures quietly appeared. Chapter 80, Withering Light. Boss Leon. The Lord's Manor's people have come out in full force. At this moment, their internal defenses are empty. Should we go straight into the manor? In the alley. A member of the Silver Frost Brotherhood suppressed his excitement and said. Leon's expression changed. He raised his hand and smacked the man's head. Don't even think about it. Do you think the people of the Suki family are fools? Riagar had at least left a small team in the manor. The Lord's Mansion must have other security forces. Moreover, what good would attacking the Lord's Mansion do us? The lackey scratched his head in embarrassment. Leon looked at the flickering lights in the manor and waved his hand decisively. Let's go. Where to? A few lackeys quickly asked. Prison, of course. Boss Dean, Morris, and my stupid partner Jonas are all in prison. Now is the time to save them. Leon calmly led his men through Rolling Stone Town at night. After Jonas was arrested for participating in the Martin Run. 
he had secretly scouted Rolling Stone Town countless times. At this moment, he was familiar with the place. After a while, they arrived outside the high walls of Rolling Stone Town Prison. Northeast. There was a tall tower. There seemed to be someone watching from above. Just as Leon was about to personally lead his team to the watchtower to take out the guards. Suddenly, there was a commotion near the high wall. A few figures sneaked out from under the high wall. Boss Dean. Leon shouted uncertainly. Leon? You came at the right time. Damn it, we finally met a reliable friend. In the darkness. Dean cursed as he walked out. Behind him was Jonas, who looked ashamed. As for the tall Morris, he was supporting Dean. Leon then noticed that Dean was limping. Before he could ask. Dean took the initiative to scold, Jonas, that idiot. I brought him out of prison, but he fell in the tunnel I dug. In the end, he was fine, but he broke my leg. Leon had a strange look on his face. After a long time, he finally managed to hold back his laughter. Leon called the other lackeys over and looked at the watchtower nervously. Then do we need to evacuate this town quickly? The order of calamity has brought the underground coalition army with them, and they are very powerful. If we continue to cooperate with them, our relationship will probably be out of balance. Dean shook his head. You shouldn't have been instigated by the Order of Calamity from the beginning. They have a deep relationship with the underground people, and they are not on the same path as us. Rolling Stone Town isn't as simple as you think. I still don't understand how I was captured by them. The bearded garrison captain is indeed powerful, but he can't keep up with my speed. This is why I haven't escaped. If I hadn't received your emergency signal, I wouldn't have taken the risk to come out now. Morris couldn't help but interrupt, Boss Dean, aren't we being too careful? Maybe we just slipped that day? And look at how we escaped, and their guards didn't even notice us. In my opinion, Rolling Stone Town isn't any different from other towns. Jonas expressed a different opinion. I think this town is a little strange. I was caught just because I ran a little faster. This is unbelievable. However, Dean interrupted him, I don't want to hear you again. Shut up. Jonas lowered his head in the grievance. We're already out. It's definitely impossible for us to leave just like that. Dean whispered, Leon, report to me the information from the outside. Let's ignore the watchtower first. The group of people left the prison in small groups. A moment later. They found an abandoned workshop to hide in. Dean hurriedly dealt with the fractured calf and used his outstanding tenacity to suppress the pain. So, are they going to have a decisive battle in the north of Rolling Stone Town? After listening to Leon's narration, Dean's eyes lit up. Then we can't just leave like this. We have to do something. Morris said excitedly, take advantage of the situation and kill them all. Leon cautiously suggested, I don't think it's necessary for us to draw the attention of the Order of Calamity. We don't know the internal defense of Rolling Stone Town either. If we poke the hornet's nest rashly, we might get caught in it. Dean nodded in agreement. You're right. We don't have to, and we don't have the right to kill in Rolling Stone Town. Remember our profession. We're arsonists, not murderers. Restraint is the most important virtue. We'll just set the fire and leave the rest to the order of calamity. The question now is, where should we start the fire? Leon immediately drew a sketch of Rolling Stone Town on the ground. First, we'll eliminate the Mage area, the Suki family area, and prison area. Although the Mage district in Rolling Stone Town has an empty title, Dean calmly analyzed. Ronan is also said to be trapped in the astral world. There is no need to take the initiative to make enemies with the legendary Mage. It's the same in the Suki family district. There are only small nobles and knights there and our principle has always been to kill civilians rather than offend nobles. There are many guards in the prison area. Although these guards are not powerful, it is still troublesome to deal with them. Only the craftsman area, workshop area, civilian area, and farm area were left on the map. Theoretically, the civilian area and the farm area are the best, but the former is too far away from us and close to the battlefield. The latter is simply at the edge of the battlefield, so the risk is too high. There are not many people in the workshop area at night. Even if the fire is successfully set, it will be difficult to create chaos. Following Dean's exquisite analysis, only the craftsman district was left on the map. Let's go there. Dean said decisively. The group moved out again. 
Jonas carried the limping Dean towards the craftsman's area. Ten minutes later. In the center of the craftsman area. This is it. This iconic building is tailor-made for us. Dean suppressed his excitement. In the art of arson, the more people involved, the better the effect. The more famous the building that was burned, the better. The building in front of him was obviously the most eye-catching one in the craftsman's district. Jonas, carry me. Morris and I will set the fire inside. Leave a few people behind for support. Dean quickly arranged. After setting the fire, we will leave the town from the northwest. Leon, you go and arrange the retreat route. Of course, you can also choose some suitable targets to burn along the way. Leon nodded in dissatisfaction. Dean did this because he didn't want to share the spoils. He was clearly the most intelligent one in the Brotherhood. Leon suppressed his unhappiness and brought a few of his followers to the north of the craftsman's district. The rest of the people quietly sneaked into the building under Dean's lead. The moonlight shone gently. Outside the hall on the first floor. The sign of the Craftsman Protection Association was clearly visible. North of the Oak Forest. Evil Art Master Anderson's order was firmly carried out. On the battlefield. Led by the flag-carrying Boar Warrior, they advanced step by step. From the side, a strong knoll led a group of people around the forest and attacked in a roundabout way. They want to attack the farm area. Matthew reminded. I'll go. Zeller suddenly mounted his horse. His riding skills were superb, and he soon arrived at the eastern part of the forest. It had to be said that his action was very dangerous. Under the pressure of the enemy, a spellcaster who left the team without permission could easily be targeted by the enemy. However, Zeller was very confident. He sat on the back of the horse and suddenly chanted a very short spell. Then, Matthew saw him take out a musket from his backpack. Magic gun? Matthew didn't expect Zeller to have such high-quality goods. Bang! Zeller gently pulled the trigger of the magic blaster, and a blazing fireball shot out. It actually crossed a distance of about 200 meters and hit the wild land east of the Knoll Squad and the Oak Forest. Not only that. After the fireball landed on the ground, it burned fiercely into a wall of fire that was a hook 30 meters long. At the same time, the spell Zeller had chanted earlier also took effect. A strong wind suddenly blew around him. Immediately after, an air elemental with an extremely muscular appearance appeared out of thin air. Zeller ordered him skillfully. The air elemental flew to the top of the wall of fire with a reluctant look on its face and then blew down fiercely. Hoo hoo hoo! The walls of fire extended for 50 to 60 meters on both sides. Its height had also increased to more than 2 meters. The knoll's eastward route was instantly blocked. Zeller had single-handedly obstructed Anderson's plan to divide his forces. Matthew heaved a sigh of relief. He took a look at the shape and color of the air elemental and determined that it was an air elemental elder. This meant that Zeller was at least a tier 4 warlock. He felt much more at ease. Then, he turned his attention to the battlefield. In fact, ever since the appearance of the Bone Dragon, Matthew had been working hard on his job, summoning the dead. More and more corpses were awakened by him. The good ones would become silver moon zombies, and the bad ones would become skeleton soldiers. These undead creatures lined up in an irregular formation in the north of the oak forest, silently welcoming the army that was inspired by the horn. As Matthew summoned more and more undead creatures, his mana was also gradually running out. His head was in even more pain. I can't drop the ball at this juncture. Matthew took a deep breath. He took out three items from the bottom of the magic bag, negative energy stones, sobriety stickers, and mana tobacco leaves. He held the negative energy stone in his palm to reduce the negative energy consumption when summoning the dead. The sobriety sticker was pasted on his forehead. It could provide a cool and stinging sensation and stimulate the recovery of mana to a certain extent. However, long-term use had great side effects, and it was easy for me to become addicted. In the end. Matthew stuffed the crumpled mana tobacco leaf into his mouth and chewed it carefully. In the next moment, a strong force surged out of his mouth. His eyes began to tear up, and thick black smoke came out of his nostrils. Cough, cough, cough. It was the first time Matthew had taken mana tobacco, and he choked. But after a brief discomfort, he could feel that his mana, which was gradually running out, had recovered a little. Phew. Matthew exhaled a long cloud of smoke. In the next moment, he chewed up all the tobacco leaves and swallowed them. Then, 
he continued to summon the dead souls tirelessly. A few seconds later. Hint, you have summoned and maintained more than 100 undead. During the summoning process, you have gained a new understanding of the undying domain. You have mastered a new ability, Withering Light. Withering Light, you can activate a grey light on your undead. Those who are enveloped by the grey light will continue to suffer the debuff of decreasing.